everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the a and eLearning Academy. Um, during this presentation, if you have any questions, you will be muted. So please use the Q&A or the chat feature, and I will then read them to Sam whenever we take question breaks. Um, we are very excited to hear from Sam, and I'll go ahead and let him get started with this. Thank you very much, Logan. Yeah. Well, Good morning uh, to uh, most people, except uh, those of you in uh, Central or uh, East Coast uh, time zones. Uh, welcome to our first uh, Young Collectors Corner uh, online. Uh, this is a presentation that I usually do at our uh, national shows a couple times a year, but unfortunately we're not able to meet uh, in person right now. So I really appreciate you guys uh, making it today to uh, the meeting. Um, online uh, on our website, we do have a... Uh, packet you can download um, that, that kind of goes through this uh, the activities as we go through them today. You won't have an exact copy of my presentation, but you'll at least have uh, uh, quite a few of the uh, really important uh, bits of information as we're going. Uh, I know you may have some questions as we do this. Of course, uh, please use the uh, chat or uh, Q&A functions in Zoom. Uh, we will be taking some breaks today, of course, um, a, a few times. It's a very long presentation. So Without uh, any further delay, uh, just uh, let's get started with this. So first of all, um, what we're going to be doing in this program today, um, and it, it is going to be a lot of information, uh, so I do apologize about that beforehand, uh, which is why we'll be taking many breaks. So uh, please uh, try and stay with us. Um, if for some reason you need to take a break, um, most of you are at home. You can do that on your own. So what we're going to be doing today, everyone, uh, first of all, is we're going to be talking about the basics of the hobby that we're all here to discuss, numismatics. It's the fancy way of saying coin collecting. We're going to uh, talk about how coins are made, uh, the different parts of a coin. There's a lot of them. Uh, same with paper money. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, we'll talk about the different terms used to describe coins. Um, as well as grades or the overall conditions. That's a very important part of being a good coin collector is knowing how to properly evaluate coins. Uh, it's important also to know how to handle them and store them properly. So we'll be discussing that. Uh, we'll also uh, talk about coin reference books, magazines, and of course, websites. Um, we'll also learn about different coin denominations. That's a fancy way of saying the amount and uh, the different design types of coins. Uh, uh, primarily the ones we have for the United States. There are way too many to talk about from uh, all across the world, so we can't really get into that today. And uh, mostly what we're going to be doing is just talking about coins, paper money, and really uh, just to have a good time. And, uh, of course, we're here to learn. Um, so when you have questions, again, if uh, please keep them on topic. Um, and, again, like I said, we'll pause for some uh, Q&A and uh, some uh, few-minute breaks. And um, folks, just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. All you kiddos who made it, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time today. Um, like it says on the screen there, you are encouraged to collect anything you want in any way that you want to. So that's the really great thing about a hobby like numismatics. Uh, it's the way you want to do it. So uh, keep in mind, though, good collectors always help each other learn. So I have no doubt that some of the... Uh, YNs or young numismatists, I know they may uh, be joining in on this chat, you know, trying to help me if they see me uh, making any mistakes, but hopefully that won't happen today. So what is numismatics? Like I said before, it's really the study of coin collecting. It's the hobby of uh, coin collecting, and that includes tokens, paper money, uh, things like wooden nickels, squished pennies, all sorts of things that are like that, anything really related to money. Um, and it says, while numismatists are often characterized as students or collectors of coins, it really includes, like we said, all sorts of things that are used to uh, even accept payment. So you have to understand that numismatists, uh, numismatics is not unique to the United States. Uh, this was a design that we had to celebrate uh, an event we have every summer called Summer Seminar. And we were talking about uh, how many different languages we come up with, how many... Uh, different people across the globe are coin collectors. And as you can see on screen there, there's a lot of different ways to say coin collector. So 
let's get right into this. So money. Um, now, this is really not a question we'll be answering live together, but why do we really need money in this life? And you have to, first of all, think, well, what is money? And before we even had money, how did we get the things we needed to live? So really, I mean, there were no stores. You couldn't just uh, run to the Walmart or the Target. So you had to go out and get your own food, all your own materials. And if you had your own materials and you needed to exchange them with anyone else, you could. So if you could go out and hunt or gather to get the things you need, you might be able to trade without using money or barter. So bartering is trading um, or exchanging goods or services for other goods and services without really using what we call money nowadays. But you have to understand, sometimes in life, um, there are some items that we need more than others. So the demand for things changes uh, based on who needs it and when they need it. So a lot of times that can really change prices of things. So what really is money? Now, if you look here, you'll see some of the things that we've used before as money. Uh, animals, like parts of animals or even the entire animal. Uh, grains, uh, such as corn, rice, wheat. Cowrie shells, um, very important uh, form of money. Now, I know some of you all uh, ordered our little supplemental kit that uh, I put together. Um, there was a lot more stuff in there than uh, what we said was going to be. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And of course, uh, hopefully you already have that kit out. And uh, we'll be going over a lot of those different things today that we included. But there are a lot of different things that are money. I mean, of course, we're used to paper money here, of course. But uh, I mean, credit cards, those are money. Even gift cards are technically money. It's something that can be traded for a good or service, correct? So when you talk about why we would use something as money, you have to really think what makes something good to use as money? Um, why should we use it as money? So you have to first understand it needs to be tough. It's got to be something uh, durable, something strong. Uh, portability is a good thing. You want to be able to move it around from place to place. Uh, not really... Uh, Good, if you look at the pictures on screen there of what they call Yap Stone Island uh, or Yap Island Stone Money. Um, it's not used as money the way we would nowadays, but in uh, uh, the culture of the people living on a tiny island in the South Pacific, uh, these are very sacred stones, what they call Rai, uh, R-A-I. Um, and uh, you can tell they don't really, uh, they're definitely tough. I mean, they're strong, made out of a, uh, um, a low-grade form of quartz uh, calcite, but they aren't really portable, are they? You can see there's a guy who looks like he's uh, going to break his arm off if he tries moving that there at the bottom. And then, of course, uh, you, know, you have um, you know these guys right up here. They, in order to move that, you really have to have a, 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 a huge rod. That's why they have money going right through it, or a, a hole. Uh, going right through it. You can just drive a tree trunk straight through it to move it if they ever had to. Is it uh, demandable? Is a, a form of money has to be something that people want to use as money. It needs to be something that's in demand. Uh, so it needs to be kind of tough to find. It should be kind of scarce. It shouldn't just be something laying around. Divisible. Can you make change from it? That's an important part as well. And of course, people have to trust uh, the money that's being issued. We can't just take pieces of paper and write $100 and try and use that at the store. It's not from a government authority. And of course, money uh, has to be difficult to reproduce, uh, or the fancy word for that uh, right there, counterfeit. Um, you want to make it really hard to, to for other people to make. Um, so we'll talk about uh, some of the anti-counterfeiting measures that we use on paper money. A lot of them, you guys probably didn't even know were out there, but we'll get into that in a little while. But when we're talking about how a government has to authorize or give the, uh, the power to make money, it has to be a, what we call legal tender. Now, if you are a scout, and we'll talk about this again a little bit later, for scouts, 
Uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting next Saturday at the same time uh, to go over the merit badge requirements. Uh, I apologize if I didn't mention that earlier. But like I was saying before, one of the uh, merit badge requirements for scouts is uh, you de do need to know what legal tender means. Now, on your uh, paper uh, bank notes uh, that we have here in the United States, you have the obligation or what they call the legal tender clause. Uh, legal tender means it's a medium of payment or a form of payment that's uh, recognized um, to meet uh, an obligation, something that you can use to buy and sell things. So this is kind of strange, but there are coins that are made that could be spent as money, but they're not really designed to. You can see some of them on the screen right there. Um, these are, some of them are what they call collector coins and they're really nice. Um, that one down here in the bottom right is a huge piece of uh, gold uh, that um, you can see it takes a few guys to actually move right there. That's actually um, from 2007. It's a $1 million face value Canadian gold uh, coin. Uh, it weighs 100 kilograms. So it's uh, about 3,215 ounces of gold. Uh, right now it's worth probably about $6.43 million, a little bit of money. Um, so it's strange when you talk about what you know could be money. There are some coins, uh, I'll show you some more later that can be in all different uh, styles or shapes and colors. Uh, they don't always have to be round and, uh, you know, flat designs like we kind of have now in the United States. It wasn't always like that. We had some really cool designs a long time ago. So moving right along, like we were saying before, what is money? I mean, candy. Could candy be considered money? Well, maybe. You could buy and sell or trade it with other people. Could a bicycle or feathers be considered money? What about a teddy bear? What about gold bricks? And of course, we always talk about gold as being very valuable. And really, um, you have to understand, when the metals that we uh, get to make money come from what we call ores or rocks that have metals inside of them. We have to crush them up, uh, refine them, of course, and then melt them down. Um, Hopefully, I don't have to tell too many of you guys, uh, if you know ores, uh, chances are some of you guys uh, have played some Minecraft in your day. Um, you can see on the screen there, we've got an example right here of gold ore. Uh, right here in the middle is silver ore, and then over here on the right is iron ore. I think that's one that you might see in Minecraft. I'm a little bit of an old guy. I've never played Minecraft. So hopefully, you guys know what certain ores were. Now... The first coins in history, as far as we know, um, and there is some argument, uh, maybe uh, possibly somewhere in China they were using them, but as far as what we know in what we call the Western world, the first real coins as we know them were made by a group of people called the Lydians. Uh, Lydia is, uh, it was an old area by ancient Greece. Uh, it's the modern day country of Turkey. And the people of Lydia found these lumps of gold and silver. It was a mix of uh, gold and silver, something we call electrum. They found this in their, uh, in their streams and rivers. They stamped it with the royal seal, as you can see there on the screen. And um, this probably started about 2,600, 2,700 years ago. And these are the first real coins as we know them. As time goes on, they realize that gold is a uh, a bit rarer of a metal to find than silver. Uh, at around that time, probably about 16 times more rare than silver. So they start making coins more of pure gold and then pure silver as time goes on. So when you talk about the first paper money in world history, um, you notice I have paper in quotes there because we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, your paper is not really made of real paper, uh, like the stuff we write on nowadays. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, what it's really made out of. But the first paper in uh, per, uh, first paper money in world history that we talk about is developed in China during the time of a family that ruled called the Tang. Uh, in the Tang Dynasty, uh, this was a family in power from about the year 618 to 907. So we're talking well over a thousand years ago. Um, they had to do this because there were not enough metal uh, to make coins for everyone. So they would start uh, writing notes that said how much you had to give someone. 
uh, something that we might call checks nowadays. Uh, but because paper money is really light, uh, it was nicknamed flying money, of course, because it could just blow away by the wind. So here's an example of uh, some early paper money from the Ming Dynasty in China. It's a little after the Tang Dynasty. And you notice it kind of has like that bluish gray tint. Um, that's actually because it was made of mulberry bark. Mulberry is a very, uh, um, well, it's a tree that's all around China quite a bit. Uh, if you're familiar with silk or silkworms, and you may have heard of mulberry before. But um, that was what the first real paper money or you know, flying money was really made out of. So, folks, um, we can take a quick little break in uh, just a moment because we are going to have a, you know, quite a, a bit of information. But before we do, and I know this is going to be hard for everyone to kind of share, and you can try and type this if you want to, but uh, it may be a little bit difficult. But um, first of all, don't forget, just to review, what is money? Really, money is anything that people believe has value and it will accept for payment for goods and services. Remember I said, is a piece of candy money? Well, I guess it could be. What about a Band-Aid? Well, I guess it could be. It could be worth a lot more if you've got a really bad cut, right? So remember, like we said before, the value of something can change depending on how in demand it is. Uh, and of course, examples of money, it would take us way too long to try and name everything that's been used as money in world history. So many different things out there. So how did we get the items we need to live before the invention of money? Remember, if you, you couldn't go to the store, you had to go out and hunt it, you had to go out and gather it, and of course, bartering, trading without using uh, money. Remember, we said there are certain things that make something useful as a uh, form of money. We want it to be tough, we want it to be something that can be carried place to place. It should be something that's demandable, something that's you know, worthwhile to have as money. Uh, it should have divisible units or you should be able to make change for it. And we have that in America, of course. Um, trusted. Why do we think it should be worth something? With our money, it's really because the government says so. Uh, and it should be tough to counterfeit as well. You don't want anyone just making their own money in their garage, right? Or their basement. So guys, um, I guess what we could do is some of you will probably have some questions. If you needed to uh, run, uh, take a break for about five minutes, uh, we'll be coming back in about five. But um, Logan, I uh, suppose if we uh, had any uh, questions uh, that people wanted to get to before we move on. Um, I have one that is asking about a price of a coin. Do you want to answer those kind of questions or if we're going to? Well, we can't really do that because... Um, we're an educational nonprofit organization. Uh, we're not a part of the marketplace. We don't buy and sell things. Uh, we do have a lot of beautiful coins on display in our museum, and some of them we know are worth millions of dollars, um, but we can't really establish prices for coins. So uh, on our website, money.org, uh, at the very top of the screen where it says find a dealer, if you click on that, it'll open our dealer directory. Uh, please find a dealer nearby you and they can help uh, establish prices. It's uh, pretty tricky. I mean, I know you can look online, but be careful what you see. Uh, there are some things I might tell you, yes, a penny from 1971 is worth $28,000, but ignore. So yeah, don't always pay attention to that. But yeah, unfortunately, we can't really provide uh, values for most coins. Um, but just know that if you're talking about wheat cents, most of them are worth about two or three cents a piece. And uh, that's about the basics we can give you right now as far as money is concerned. Okay, thank you. And next, um, somebody said you mentioned next Saturday's BSA Merit Badge Worksheet mm -hmm. session. What time does it start and how long do you expect it to go? Excellent question. It'll start at the same time as this meeting uh, on the 21st. Uh, so next Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. Um, we'll, uh, at the end of this meeting, I'm going to go over the requirements that we covered and the ones that you'll need to do on your own uh, before we meet again. Uh, a lot of the ones that the scouts will need to do on their own, um, you could probably figure out if you look at the CCMB requirements. Um, some of the ones from uh, requirements number five, uh, six, seven, nine, and 10. Um, for the virtual exhibits uh, that we have online, uh, 
uh, they could uh, satisfy requirement number 10. Um, there are a lot of different uh, virtual uh, exhibits, not just for our money museum, but also for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, the U.S. Mint, uh, the Federal Reserve. So there's lots of ways you can meet requirement number 10 right now. So, but again, we'll review all of these at the very end, uh, just because this meeting isn't primarily for scouts alone. So this is for any uh, young uh, kiddo out there who wants to learn about money. But hopefully there are going to be some scouts who will be joining us next weekend uh, to do this. Uh, we'll also talk with uh, Girl Scouts who are interested in the Fun With Money patch that we have available exclusively here at the ANA. Um, all of this information is available on the ANA website, too, under Young Numismatist Resources. Uh, if you just click on the uh, little tile or app for scouts. So uh, should be uh, all posted right there. Perfect. And then someone asked, were these things used as money because they were hard to get? I'm assuming that. Yes. Yeah. Back then, uh, seashells weren't necessarily just uh, um, laying on uh, all over the beach. Cowrie shells. Some of them were, but... Uh, for a lot of other items, you know, you had to really uh, work hard to get. For example, one of my favorite uh, objects we have as money in the Money Museum here in Colorado Springs is we have a bracelet made out of the tail hair of an elephant. And you might think, well, why would something like that have value? And you have to ask yourself, well, how hard do you think it was to get the tail hair of an elephant without making them really angry? So... There's lots of things. I mean, there's beautiful feathers that people have thought were uh, useful as money. Um, when you talk about certain native tribes in certain places in South America, in Africa, uh, in, in Asia, and hey, even here in uh, uh, North America, and especially Central America, for sure. So, uh, Logan, any other uh, questions we had there? Yeah, so um, somebody wanted to know if you could go back to the legal tender slide so that they could see it again. I could probably, well, well, legal tender. Um, yeah, it's going to be a little tricky. Let me see if I can, uh, I'll have to stop uh, the share on this real quick uh, so I can get to that. Um, yeah, let me uh, see if I can uh, get that slide up here. It'll uh, take me just a second. And then, uh, could you answer another question while you're looking for yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Does platinum come from ore? Platinum absolutely does come from ore. Yes. Um, a lot of platinum. Yeah, it's usually a, a, a lot of what they call the PGMs or platinum group metals are usually found together. Um, usually we'll find uh, platinum, palladium, rhodium. Uh, a lot of the, those heavier metals are uh, usually found together. Um, uh, and usually along with nickel as well. Um, pretty tough to find, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I can uh, okay. get this on the screen here, but unfortunately while I'm trying to get that on the screen, it won't really let me uh, share. Um, it's, I mean, I, I can share that uh, legal tender, um, the definition one more time. Uh, it's just real tricky to try and go back and, into the That's presentation fine. right now. I apologize to no, uh, asking that question, but legal tender, um, it's a medium of payment or a form of payment that's recognized by a government to be valid for meeting a financial obligation. It means that a government has given permission for that item to be used as money in that country. So hopefully uh, that answered uh, the question a bit uh Better there. All right, I'm gonna. All right, I think that's all of the questions we have right now. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna. Yeah, unfortunately, I just realized it's not really uh let me go back into the presentation uh too easily. So. Uh, yeah. Um, I apologize about that, guys. It's just it's hard hard to stop the show once we've uh, got the ball rolling. Um. I mean, of course, we've all been using Zoom for decades, so you know, we're experts <laughs> at it now. <laughs> Thank you, Corona. All right, so let's get back to sharing the screen where we were. All right, so we're back uh, with that uh, square, shared screen. Logan, we good? Yep, you're good. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, guys, so... Moving right along, we're going to get 
into. All right, yeah, let's end this break. Oop, come on. There we go. All right, break over. Okay, so now our lesson on coin anatomy. Now, uh, kind of a mashup of a word, coins and anatomy. Uh, hopefully, some of you know that anatomy is pretty much the study of the parts of the body. You know, we all have many different parts that make us. There are many different parts that make up a coin. Now, this is uh, one screen that I have uh, in my presentation. You all uh, will have this uh, in your packet if you downloaded that packet or the uh, program guide that we have. So you can tell if you look right there on the screen, there are many different parts of a coin. You see all the different arrows uh, pointing to all these different places. So if you have this, if you downloaded the program guide, make sure you have this out right now as we go through the uh, different parts of a coin. So first of all, let's talk about the, uh, the date. Now, of course, that usually tells you when a coin was minted or made. Um, not always. I mean, there are sometimes they made coins in America uh, within a year or two different. Uh, I mean, the mint is a gigantic factory where they make our coins. Um, so sometimes they'll make them with a different date going into the next year. Uh, they won't sit there and make coins from the 1800s. That would be illegal. Um, but sometimes they do them pretty much within uh, a year or two of the actual date that it was made. Uh, and of course, not all coins are dated. I know some of you all, uh, when you got the, those packets from me, you might have found a really cool little uh, piece of ancient uh, Roman bronze uh, in the in the uh, activity uh, or the uh, supplementary kit that we uh, made. Um, there are no dates on these. You just knew the date by who the emperor was. Um, looking back on when that emperor ruled is when we know when those coins were made. Pretty interesting. And believe it or not, ancient Roman coins are not really worth a ton of money. They made tons of them. I mean, there are some ancient coins that are worth a lot of money. But uh, the little Roman bronze coins like this, not too expensive, fortunately. So we can study them for history. The historical value is through the roof. But monetarily, maybe worth about a dollar or two. Moving on. So the denomination, that's a fancy word that means the amount of the coin. Uh, it, it's what they call the face value of the coin. And you'll see this on most coins, uh, especially in the United States, we usually include that. Um, the designer's initials, I'm sure some of you all out there are artists. Uh, anytime you make a drawing, do you sign it or put your initials on it? I hope so. Um, coin artists are you know, similar. They like to get credit for their work. So sometimes they'll include their initials at the bottom of a, you usually might find like at the bottom of the neck of the person on the front of the coin. Um, sometimes they're hiding in other places. Those of you that like to collect wheat cents are probably familiar with the initials of a guy named Victor David Brenner or a VDB, which is at the bottom of some of the 1909 uh, Lincoln cents, uh, the first year that coin came out. So device, that's a fancy way of saying uh, the portrait or the pictures on a coin. Uh, it's the main image. Um, there's also, there may be other images as well, but the, uh, the, there's like the main device a lot of times on a coin. Uh, with most United States coins on the front of the coin, or what we'll learn uh, in, in just a moment here, that proper term, um, usually it's uh, the picture of a person. And that's like the main device, that picture. The edge, now this is one of a, a very important part to understand about a coin. The edge is really what we call the third side of a coin. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask people all the time is, how many sides are there on a coin? Of course, you know, you've got this one that you can see. There's that one, and we'll talk about these in a little bit. You guys are probably thinking they're heads and tails. That's not correct. But then the third side, the edge. We'll talk about the edges of coins a little bit later. So that's a Morgan dollar from my uh, personal collection. I've had that since I was about 10 years old. So anyway, um, the edge is the third side of the coin. It could be smooth. It could have reeds. Uh, it could be engraved with words, stars, or letters. We'll talk about that a little later. Field. Now, that's a pretty easy one to understand. A field is blank. There's nothing there. It's the flat area of a coin. It hasn't been raised. It hasn't been struck into. It's just completely flat. The legend. Legend is another way of saying uh, words or the inscription on a coin. 
Um, it tells uh, information like where a coin might be from, which is kind of an important thing. Mint mark. Now, this is a tiny little letter, and we'll get into this in just a little bit. Uh, mint marks are tiny letters that tell you where a coin was made or minted. Uh, a lot of times people will uh, ask us coin questions here at the ANA, and they say, yeah, I've got a really strange coin. It looks like it was misprinted. And I always tell them, well, it's not really a coin then because paper is printed, but coins are minted. So we'll talk about these little letters that you'll see on coins in uh, just a little while. Um, mottos uh, are very important. Uh, they're words or phrases with very special meaning to a country. Um, for example, uh, on the, in the United States, we've got some great mottos. Liberty, that's one of my favorite ones. We've had that on our coins going back to the 1700s. Uh, in God We Trust, that's something that started around the time of the Civil War in the 1860s. Very scary time in American history, if you haven't studied it already. And then, of course, uh, another important one, e pluribus unum, which is Latin for out of many, one. It means like all out of all these many people that we have here from all these different places, we're one nation together. Now, the obverse, that's a fancy word I was waiting for because obverse is really the, the way to say the heads side of a coin. Um, you can still say heads, and we'll talk a little in a little while why we call that the head side of a coin. Um, of course, you can see on the back, the reverse, and that's a pretty easy one to understand. So three sides to a coin, obverse, oh, sorry, obverse, reverse, and the edge. Now, relief, um, of course, we use that uh, in different ways when we're not talking about coins, but relief is pretty much how high up off the surface of the, the field does the design come for a coin? So it's the raised or the bumpy portion of the design that sticks up higher than the field. Uh, the rim, rim is a pretty tricky part. I'll try and explain this in a little while. Um, the rim of a coin is just on inside of the edge. It runs all along the outside of the, uh, the coin and it helps protect the, the entire design when the coin is used as money in circulation. It also helps the coin stack pretty nice, which bankers find uh, a lot, uh, well, very helpful. So remember, we said we'll discuss why we say heads and tails. Now, this is one of my favorite ancient coins in world history. This is from the ancient Greek city-state of Athens, which is actually now the capital of the country of Greece. Why do we always say heads and tails? Because going back to ancient times, you would usually see on one side of a coin, um, uh, this isn't really the picture of a real person. Uh, this is a representation. If you've studied Greek mythology, um, back when people used to focus on more than one god, many, many gods and goddesses, um, this is Athena. Uh, she is the protector of the city-state of Athens the goddess of wisdom. Uh, and if you remember, you're Winnie the Pooh. Remember the smart person in the forest, the smart one in the forest? Mr. Owl. Owls, of course, have been a symbol of wisdom, as you can tell there, since ancient times. So her patron animal is on the reverse, the, uh, the beloved owl, which is my uh, college mascot, Florida Atlantic University. And of course, you can see right down there the uh, um, abbreviation for the uh, Greek uh, city-state Athens, uh, Alpha, Theta, Epsilon, uh, Greek letters there. So that's why we would usually say heads and tails, because you usually see heads on one side, tail on another. So moving right along, mint marks are those little letters like I said on United States coins that tell you where a coin was made. Now, in the United States, we currently have, well, technically there are five main facilities that are working together, but only four where they actually strike coins. The first one, the oldest one, is in Philadelphia. And because they were the oldest one, they didn't always use a P mint mark on their coins. Um, really, the first time they ever put a P mint mark on a coin was during World War II um, in, with uh, some nickels that we uh, had to make. And that's a story for another time. Um, 
then the next men that we had after that was actually in San Francisco uh, because there was a big gold rush that went out to uh, California um, in the uh, late 1840s. And then they needed money out there. So they couldn't just keep having the mint in Philadelphia make money for them. They had to have money being struck right there in San Francisco. Um, of course, there were other gold strikes as well in history. And that's why there have been other mints. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, if you uh, so the coins from San Francisco will have a little S mint mark on them. Uh, nowadays, they make coins uh, that we call proof coins. Um, and again, if you ordered one of those uh, supplementary uh, kits that I uh, was mailing out to people, uh, you got a 2019 proof set. Uh, don't crack those coins out of that holder. Leave them in there. They'll uh, stay in good shape that way. So if you look on those coins, you'll notice an S mint mark on every single one of them. The Philadelphia Mint that we mentioned before, they make coins for everyone who lives on the east coast of the United States. Uh, pretty much everyone on the eastern half of the nation. The Denver Mint, signified by a D mint mark, they make coins for everyone on the western half of the United States. And uh, that mint, uh, which is about an hour north of us here in Colorado Springs, uh, they started in 1906. Uh, before that, they were a gold assay office uh, during the uh, Pikes Peak Gold Rush of the 1850s. But then there's another mint in New York. Uh, you may have heard of West Point if you're familiar with the Army Academy. Um, but they are also uh, responsible for keeping our nation silver secure. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of Fort Knox, where they keep our gold. Well, West Point was technically the silver Fort Knox. Um, that's where they uh, kept our silver, what they call it depository. Um, as time has gone on, um, they made coins, uh, for example, in the 1970s. They helped the Philadelphia Mint make a lot of coins during the bicentennial or the uh, 200th anniversary of the birth of the United States in uh, 1976. So they made a lot of coins back then, but they didn't have mint marks on them. Um, they've made some other coins as well, um, starting in the 1980s where they did use mint marks, but that was for what we call again, that non-circulating legal tender. Things like uh, platinum, palladium, gold, and uh, silver, uh, what they call bullion coins. Things uh, meant to be uh, saved as precious metal, not really be used as money. Um, uh, actually, one of these is a, a silver eagle right here. Uh, really, really pretty coin. So the West Point Mint, uh, they usually don't make coins for circulation with mint marks. But then um, we found out in Pittsburgh last year at a coin show, the mint director told us uh, pretty much on April 1st, so I thought he might have been kidding around, thought it was a bit of an April Fool's joke, but he told us that the West Point Mint, for the first time ever, uh, starting in 2019, they were making uh, some quarters in very limited amounts with a W mint mark. Um, we'll talk more about this a little bit later. Uh, those of you who like to go treasure hunting, if you have not started looking for the W mint mark quarters yet, you might want to do that. Um, anyway, so the mint marks that we don't see at all anymore. Um, some of the older mints, uh, and again, these were usually based on gold or silver uh, rushes throughout history. Uh, for example, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Dahlonega, Georgia, uh, they made gold coins there because there were some really uh, important gold strikes there. Um, I've actually been to Dahlonega to go panning for gold there. Uh, I drove past uh, parts of uh, the old Reed Mint there in uh, North Carolina. So uh, pretty interesting to see those places. Uh, you can actually go pan for gold there nowadays in uh, parts of Georgia and North Carolina. Really pretty stuff that comes out of the ground there. Um, there's, um, there was a mint in Carson City uh, that made uh, coins, uh, only gold and silver coins, uh, for a very short while in the late 1800s. Uh, and they, it's the only mint that had two letters. Uh, it's a C and a C. Uh, how we said before, Charlotte was just one C. And it's weird, too, because you notice D for Dahlonega. Well, how do we not confuse that with Denver? Well, it's easy because the Denver Mint didn't start until 1906. Dahlonega, they do not make coins after 1861. Same with Charlotte because of the uh, United States Civil War that was going on. Um, and those Dahlonega coins uh, from 1861 are worth a very small fortune. 
Um, and then another mint that you don't see anymore was down in New Orleans um, with the O mint mark. I don't know why they didn't use an N or an N-O, but they just went with O. So moving right along, of course, here is a picture of our five current U.S. mint facilities. Now, in the top left corner, <coughs> pardon me, in the top left corner here, you can see a uh, picture of the old U.S. Mint in Philadelphia. Down here in the lower left is a picture of the old Granite Lady, kind of at dusk, uh, right there. A uh, really pretty picture in San Francisco. Then if you come up top diagonal there uh, to the top right, that is a picture of the Denver Mint. And it's amazing, too, with the close-up. You see that big steel gate going across. Even the windows uh, still have steel gates across them. It's a huge stone building. I mean, a mint facility has to be very secure. You don't want anyone getting in there and taking our money. It could really destroy the nation's economy. And then, of course, there is the uh, picture down here in the lower right of the West Point Mint in uh, New York. But then in the middle here, yeah, that is the West Point Mint. Or, or I'm not the West Point Mint. This is Fort Knox right in the middle. Um, it's amazing. Look at how secure this facility is. Uh, you see that big, huge white fence going across on the outside. There's even another fence outside there on the perimeter there, out by the woods. I wouldn't doubt if there's a minefield here in this big, grassy area. Another fence, another field, another fence, another field, a moat of water, and then the huge building. Really tough to get into. I mean, if that's where we're going to store most of the gold in America, feel good about it and sleep good at night because it looks like it's pretty safe. So, everyone, I hope you have crayons or colored pencils handy. And I sincerely apologize for not mentioning that earlier. But I'm sure most of you kiddos probably have these around uh, not too far away. So, at this time, this is the interactive part of the presentation where... You will need to get, well, maybe just the six colors that we have are there on the screen. Red, blue, green, purple, orange, and yellow. Now, based on what we were just going over for the different parts of a coin, and you can use uh, that parts of a coin uh, sheet that we uh, have in the program guide as your guide as you go through this. That's fine. That's not cheating. That's learning. That's fine. You're just learning this concept. So you can have that sheet out as you're doing this uh, coloring sheet. So I want you to take a couple of minutes and I want you to follow the six instructions that are on there. The field, color that portion red. The device, remember what we said the device was, the main picture, color that part blue. The denomination, hopefully you remember what that is. I'm not going to mention it. The denomination, color that part green. The legend. And again, if you don't remember, you can go back into that uh, where it, it shows, you know, that little glossary of parts of a coin. Uh, color the legend purple. The rim, I want to see that orange. And then the motto needs to be yellow. So, guys, I will let you all uh, do this. Uh, Logan, uh, if you want, we can try and answer some questions uh, at this time while we're doing this. This is uh, kind of a little bit more of a flexible portion. We're going to do a, this activity, and then we'll do another fun activity. Uh, that you will need pencils for. So uh, hopefully some of you all got uh, the pencils that we sent you in those uh, program uh, kits. Um, please have it sharpened if you didn't do so already. So yeah, Logan, uh, if we had any other uh, questions right now, we could uh, answer those while uh, the kiddos are coloring. Yeah, I just want to remind you guys, we're only going to be taking breaks to send questions. So you'll have to be patient with me with that. So don't get too pushy. We'll, we'll get your questions. But uh, the first one was, what is the date of the coin you were showing? They were referring to the Greek coin that you showed for the heads and tails slide. Excellent question. Yeah, that's um, a good date. I'd probably say uh, just shy of uh, 500 BC, probably around 480 BC. So yeah, definitely about 2,500 years old. Very old coin. Um, if you're wondering how you can get one for yourself, um, one of them that looked that nice that we were showing, probably a few hundred dollars. There are a lot of really good ancient uh, coin dealers out there. Uh, one of the best uh, that you could probably contact would be Harlan J. Burke in uh, Chicago. 
Uh, he helped sponsor our ancient coin project that we, that we have here for YNs. And I'll talk about that toward the end of the presentation. But um, yeah, you can find those uh, um, ancient Athenian uh, tetradrams. Uh, the CH uh, is kind of uh, silent. Yeah, it's a tetradram or a four dram coin. Very, very cool piece of silver. And then somebody asks where we can find the packet. If you go up to the chat, up all the way to the top, I linked it. And at the bottom of that page I linked, you can download a PDF with all the packet in it. And then another one, didn't the Carson City Mint make a few 19, 1894 coins as well? It was a question. I really have to double check. I don't remember off the top of my head. I know that they didn't make silver dollars that year. So uh, I'd have to look up. Uh, Unfortunately, as a teacher, I can't really afford many Carson City coins in my collection, so therefore I haven't studied them as much as others. Um, but I know for a fact there are no silver dollars, 1894. Um, they may have made other gold coins, um, but I, it doesn't sound right. I, I, and I guess I could look in our Red Book. Speaking of which, those of you who uh, actually did get the uh, supplementary kit from us, uh, you got a very cool edition of the Red Book. Um, this is something that was uh, really uh, put out by uh, NGC uh, uh, Grading Company, or the, the one that you guys got. This is a different one I have from uh, 2017. I think you guys got even a better one from uh, uh, that NGC, uh, Numismatic Guarantee Corporation. Uh, really good company for getting coins uh, graded and professionally certified. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I think that's all the questions for right now. That's all we had for now. Okay. Um, I know everyone colors at different speeds. And uh, if you didn't finish this, that's okay. You can always come back to another time. But uh, I guess we should uh, go on to the reveal to see if you guys got this right. So hopefully what you guys did looks something similar to this. Um, again, that orange part, that might be one of the hardest things for you guys to understand. Uh, Logan, I don't know if you can tell me, uh, can you see the arrow as I'm uh, doing it on the share screen here? Yes, I can. Okay, good. I know there's a laser pointer function in uh, Zoom here, but it, uh, or in PowerPoint, but it doesn't really work as well um, because it's PowerPoint trying to translate to Zoom and then upload it, so it takes too long. So I'll just use uh, the little arrow right here. If you can see where I'm pointing to right here, uh, all you guys, that orange part, that's what we call the rim. It's just on the inside. It's on each side of the coin. It's on the obverse and reverse. It's not the edge. It's just before you get to the edge on both sides of the coin. So that might be the trickiest part to understand. Um, the motto on this side of the coin is e pluribus unum. The legend would be United States of America. The denomination, again, remember, denomination tells you the amount. So five cents at the bottom there should be green. If you did everything that looks like that, good job. So now, this is always a very fun activity. I don't know how many of you guys have ever done coin rubbings before. And um, if this is the first time you do it, chances are it will not be the last because it's kind of fun, uh, really fun activity to do. Um, and the reason why we have that big circle there, um, if you downloaded that program guide, you have this. Um, if you didn't, that's fine. Just grab any old sheet of paper and a pencil. Now, the really tricky part about doing a rubbing for coins is I know ordinarily when we uh, write on paper, you know, you're writing straight up and down. But when you're doing a coin rubbing, you're, put, you're taking the coin and putting it underneath the sheet of paper. And then you're gently holding the pencil sideways and kind of just rubbing it like that to get the design to come up. So hopefully you all have a grown up or someone older around uh, who can help you figure out how to do this. Um, but take a couple minutes. Uh, hopefully you guys have some coins laying around with you right now. If you ordered our supplementary kit, you did get a couple coins. Take any one of those coins and uh, lay it flat on the, on the desk or the table where you are. And again, remember, Hold the pencil sideways. I always think it's good technique when you're doing a coin rubbing to hold the pencil like this and go back and forth over the paper like that instead of up and down. So while you guys are doing this uh, coin rubbing activity, hopefully you saw the uh, other coin uh, rubbings that are on the screen here, some samples. 
you can see uh, up here, um, there's one kiddo who uh, did one with uh, crayons. And the, the trick, if you're going to use crayons, even with pencil too, you want to go very lightly over the paper. You just barely want to touch the paper uh, with the pencil or the crayon. Um, you can see right here, someone got really creative and made, uh, they, they took a tree outline and made all the uh, little leaves look like coins right there. So I thought that was kind of cool. Or make the coins look like leaves. And then over here on the right, someone has way too much time on their hands. And they did a rubbing of a bunch of different coins from all around the world. Yeah, I'm seeing coins from France, Jamaica, England, Germany, Denmark, Australia. Very cool stuff. Russia, Ireland. Yeah, so uh, coin rubbing is a lot of fun if you've never done it. So figured we'd put that out there and let you guys know about another fun activity today. So we will uh, kind of take another break while you guys are finishing up that coin rubbing or if you need to go back and finish up that uh, the, um, the uh, parts of a coin, a little diagram of the buffalo nickel that we were doing. Um, so Logan, I don't know if there are any questions just yet, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions before we uh, got there, if that was okay. okay. Perfect. Cool. Well, actually, I guess we can get to those in just a little. Uh, if someone had questions, yeah, I'll ask my questions uh, when we come back in a couple of minutes. But um, uh, so did anyone there have... was one somebody asked something about um, saying they didn't want to damage their coin with rubbing. Is there any possibility of that happening? Not really. Uh, the paper is not going to. I mean, if you just, you know, drew on the coin with your pencil, yeah, you're going to have pencil marks on the coin. And, yeah, you could rub those off. But I don't recommend doing that. Um, it, the paper is going to um, protect the coin. It's not really going to damage your coin. Uh, I would not do this with one of the proof coins you got in that set. Um, um, the set uh, some of you guys got from us. Yeah, don't crack the coins out of there and do rubbings of proof coins. That will scratch the coin. Yeah, proof coins have to be uh, kept in those uh, in the hard plastic containers that they come in because uh, you don't want to risk uh, damaging uh, the surfaces of those because they're a uh, really high quality uh, finish on uh, proof coins. And then Walt Ostromecki, one of our past presidents, is on the meeting today. And he says, no coins were struck at the Carson City Mint in 19 1894. The Mint ceased operations at the end of 1893. So we have that answer now. If anyone is going to know about Carson City coins, I was going to mention it earlier, but I didn't want to call them out. Thank you, Walter. Um, yeah, um, I, anyone who is a scout in California has probably heard the name uh, Dr. Walter Ostromecki one of our uh, greatest uh, past presidents of the ANA. Uh, I knew he'd be on the uh, meeting today, so hopefully uh, he won't beat me up too bad for all the things I messed up in private later. Uh, tell me he how, said you uh, were doing a great job in the chat. He so. is the best liar I know. That is a <laughs> thank you awful. Thanks so much. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I figured, uh, yeah, were there any other questions right now? Somebody yeah. asked what the proof set was for. We just sent that out for the people who purchased the... For it, it, Collecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, I mean, you can send them back to me. Um, send them address to Sam Gelbert at the ANA and uh, with a note that, hey, Sam, this is for your collection. <laughs> no, guys, I mean, you can tell uh, I've got one. But um, no, we wanted you all to have one. We had a very generous dealer last year donate a bunch of these. Um, there was a special uh, uh, Lincoln scent that was issued from the West Point Mint and he just wanted that penny. He just wanted that Lincoln cent for himself. Uh, so he bought thousands of these sets just to get those uh, Lincoln cents. And he said, well, I don't need all those coins. So he gave them to the ANA. He said, give them to the kiddos. So that's what we're doing. So hopefully uh, you guys uh, already got one of those from us. So. I think that's all of the questions I have. For okay. Now. All right. Not a problem. Yeah, I'm just uh, throwing some random quotes up there on the screen. So uh, hopefully you guys will see them. Uh, We'll be back in a, just a minute or two. I know uh, some other people are uh, going to be back uh, momentarily. We'll let them finish doing what they're doing. I know some of you guys are probably having fun doing coin rubbings. I hope those are coming out nice right now. So I'm actually going to uh, let you guys get back to that. Um, when we come back in just a couple minutes, I will ask, uh, if anyone has any other uh, questions, so uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, I guess we could uh, 
mute that as well. But guys, uh, we'll be back shortly. Okay, everyone. So I hope everyone's uh, had a chance to take a little break there. Again, I know there's a lot of information. Just wait. There's a lot more coming. Um, again, if you need to take a break at any time, go right ahead. We'll be here. Um, if you did wind up missing something, I believe we're going to be recording this, and it'll probably be archived in our uh, ANA eLearning Academy uh, videos, so not to worry. But, boys and girls, let's uh, start getting back to this, uh, uh, answer some questions, and we'll go right back into some other questions you might have, and then we'll continue with uh, the modern minting process, how coins are actually made. So hopefully you don't ever forget this one. How many sides are on a coin? Don't forget, there are three. You've got the obverse, the reverse, and the edge. And again, those tiny little letters that you see on a coin that tell you where it was made, mint marks. Hopefully you remember that one. And remember we said that there are currently five U.S. mint facilities. Keeping in mind that Fort Knox is not an actual mint, but they're the gold depositories. So they're very instrumental. West Point is the silver depository, and they're also a mint. Um, and, of course, we have the mints of PDS, or Philadelphia, Denver, and San Francisco, that we can tell the difference because of the letters that they use to uh, signify each mint. So before we uh, go to, uh, too much further... Um, were there any other uh, questions that anyone had, Logan, uh, before we uh, move on to uh, uh, this interesting diagram that we see on the screen there? Um, let's see. Are coins from certain mints rarer than coins from other mints? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, when we were just talking a little bit ago about the Carson City Mint, um, they made a, a lot less coins than uh, some of the other mints at the same, uh, in, in the same year. Uh, the Philadelphia Mint, uh, traditionally, uh, around those times, was making more coins because there were more people that lived uh, in the eastern uh, half of the United States back in the 1800s. We were still going through what we called westward expansion, where everyone was still coming out west. So they didn't need as many coins in places like San Francisco, Carson City. Um, and then, of course, you know, where the gold strikes were for Dahlonega and Charlotte, some of those coins are very, very rare. Um, yeah, we can't even get into how uh, expensive some of those are. And yeah, and of course, uh, like we were talking before about uh, one of the uh, world's best scout masters or uh, merit badge counselors, uh, Walter Ostromecki. He, I know, is a, a huge fan of, I believe, uh, $10 Eagles from uh, the uh, Carson City Mint. Probably uh, the best collection out there of those coins. So, and then one more. Why did they make seven or so 1943 pennies why did they they made actually uh closer uh they made over a billion 1943 lincoln cents they're probably referring to the copper ones not the steel ones the steel ones yeah those are everywhere and uh only worth a few cents each but there were some leftover blanks from 1942 uh that were the traditional bronze or copper planchets that got mixed into the press in 1943 um we actually estimate that there's probably closer to about 20 or so, maybe a, a little bit more than that. A fair estimate, all things considered, is I would say there's probably 20 to 40 of them that we know about. Um, it is the number one question we get here on a daily basis at the ANA. Um, people will call us saying, well, I found a 1943 silver penny in my change, um, not realizing that it's not silver. Because uh, these uh, steel uh, 1943 cents uh, actually uh, do uh, stick to a magnet. It's the only uh, magnetic United uh, States coin that we've ever really made. And of course, um, I mean, uh, you mentioned it, so I may as well tell you. Um, I, I, I do uh, in my possession. Uh, I'll have to take it out of this to, to really show you guys. Because um, I wasn't going to mention it, but you, someone mentioned 1943. So, um yeah, the the uh, I don't know how that's uh, showing up on the screen, Logan, but uh, you can see, are you, you see the date. Uh, you can't see the date unless I huh. they can. Uh, I'm trying to zoom out. It's a 1943 copper. Very rare. If only it were real. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, there are some people who've uh, copper plated uh, the steel ones, so watch out for that. Um, the uh, genuine copper ones will weigh 3.1 grams. Uh, the steel ones only weigh 2.7 grams. So that's one good way of telling right there. So, okay. Yeah, thank interesting you. question. Yeah, very popular coin. <laughs> that's, that's all the questions we've okay. got for right now. So. Awesome. We'll all right. <laughs> so we'll just get right back into it then, boys and girls. So you'll see this slide a few different times in this presentation. If you have this out, uh, if you have that packet that you downloaded, uh, you may want to keep this uh, sheet uh, handy as we go through this because the process to make coins is very tricky. Um, but you have to understand before any of this uh, mechanical stuff can happen, it really has to start with the human touch, the artist. Um, someone has to have an idea for designs for coins. Um, and you can see here some very... Uh, important uh, mint employees uh, down in the lower left. I'm not quite sure whose arm this is making a design with uh, Abraham Lincoln right there, our 16th president. Uh, but right here is uh, a mint engraver, Frank Gasparro. You can tell he's actually making uh, designs for the half dollar in 1964, uh, right after President John F. Kennedy was uh, shot in uh, late 1963. Um, right up here, of course, Cassie McFarland. She, uh, made the uh, baseball commemorative baseball hall of fame commemorative coins very interesting designs the first time in uh, american history we were purposely making coins that were curved or cup shaped very cool design uh that uh ms mcfarland made because the obverse um is a baseball design and then the reverse is like a glove uh so it's concave and it looks like it could catch a ball really really cool concept um and of course, down at the bottom there, Don Everhart, another very important uh, designer and engraver. But it's important to know that all coin designs start off as usually drawings, um, the idea of an artist. Uh, you can tell, like we showed here in the lower left, as time has gone on, we're using computer uh, software to really help uh, make coin designs. That's why we can get some really, really intricate or really tricky designs nowadays. But when you talk about coins, now this is a, we can teach classes on this and talk to you for many days uh, about how coins are really made. But the long story short today is that from those designs, they transfer, you can tell right here where there, there's something tracing over uh, the plaster design that was engraved. And they're actually using that to cut into uh, these pieces of steel, uh, what we call dies. Um, this is actually a coin die right here uh, that I got from the Philadelphia Mint. Uh, of, this was for a uh, Lincoln cents. And you can tell they didn't want me coming home and making my own uh, pennies uh, in private in my garage. So that's why um, if they get rid of the uh, dies at the Mint, they usually will uh, efface or completely uh, uh, wipe off the uh, surface there with a... Um, uh, a grinder so you can't even see the design but these uh, pieces of steel are what they cut that design into and you might notice that this die um the image is backward it's a mirror image because when it strikes the coin then it's the right way that we want it to be on the coin so coin dies like you see right here everything is backwards the letters the numbers the pictures but on the coin it'll be the right way so it's really tricky to make coin dies because you have to start with a master and then you want to make copies of that because if something happened to a master die and it broke, well, then you can't make any more coins from that. You have to make a whole new die. So they make wor what they call working dies and the working dies are the ones that actually do the work of striking the coins themselves. It's a kind of a similar concept to, let's say you, had to make a photocopy of something and you put it on the copy machine. It's going to make a pretty close to exact copy, but it won't be the exact same quality. Say you take that copy that you just made and now you use that as your original. Well, then the copies you make from that are going to be even less quality. So that's kind of the same principle as why we make these working dies. Um, when you're older, you come out to Colorado Springs, come out to our summer seminar event. We'll explain more about how, uh, the minting process goes, but um, scouts, you may want to pay very close attention to this portion of the presentation 
because this is one of your requirements for the CCMB. Um, on the edge, or remember that third side of a coin, um, you can have it, uh, you'll, you'll notice on our coins that we use nowadays, uh, the Lincoln cent, uh, and again, uh, you might notice, uh, I keep calling them cents. A lot of you guys might call them pennies. Technically, penny is a British term. Um, in America, we make cents sometimes. Um, uh, cents are, um, it, it's an old French term, centime. Uh, that's where we got that from. So because we were at war with the British in the 1700s, there was no way we were going to use a British term like penny. So we went with the French term because they were our allies against the uh, British back then. So on the edges of coins, um, a lot of time, uh, or a, a long time ago, there were some really dishonest people in history um, that would take a, uh, a gold or silver coin and they chip away the little edges uh, or they chip little bits of, way of gold and silver off the edges of coins and save that for themselves to hopefully melt down to make a whole new coin. Um, these are people in history we call chiselers. And in fact, uh, uh, you kiddos might not know it, but your parents might. Uh, they may have heard the term chiseler as a, uh, used with someone who will steal your money or rob you. And that's technically where it comes from. A chiseler is someone who would literally chisel uh, coins to save gold and silver. Um, and governments knew this was going on after a while. So they started coming up with uh, devices or uh, items on there to protect the edges of coins. Um, going back to England uh, with the long cross pennies about Edward III, you had um, designs that went all the way to the edge but it didn't still really protect the actual edge itself. So then you have um, a design uh, made by a, a gentleman named Jean Castaigne, a Frenchman who came up with an invention, a, a machine that actually put letters on the edges of coins. Uh, and then now you can see uh, we have um, reeds that are struck into the edge. Uh, we've done it before where you could have stars or letters uh, and those golden dollars that you might see nowadays, we actually do have um, letters that are on the edges of those. Uh, real quick, though, if you find the George Washington, um, there are some known without letters on the edge. Those are worth a little bit more because uh, they're missing that edge lettering. Uh, when they first came out back in uh, 2007, they were going for about $100 a piece, but now they're probably closer to about 25 because all the excitement's uh, waned. So. Um, the reeds are just these lines or these grooved uh, lines that run vertically around the edge or the outside of the coin, uh, this middle picture that we see right there. Okay. So another term uh, that you might want to understand is clad. Um, these are what we call sandwich coins. Uh, I know it's getting toward lunchtime here for us in Colorado. I'm getting hungry, but I'll, I can wait. Uh, sandwich, it pretty much just means it's uh, layers of metal to make the coin. And if you look right down here, this is pretty much what we're talking about, those three layers uh, that make our copper nickel coins. Um, I know a lot of you kiddos probably look at your dimes and quarters and think, oh, those are silver. Well, guys, unless they're dated 1964 and earlier, they are not silver. They're these clad sandwich coins. It's a, a, pretty much they take uh, a layer of pure copper, and on either side, they sandwich it with a mix of copper and nickel, and they run it through these huge uh, rollers to press it really, really tight uh, to where it actually becomes fused together. Um, and it, that's uh, really why if you look at the edge of our uh, dimes and quarters, you'll see uh, part of that. You might not always see all three of them like that because of the way the blanks are uh, punched out of the sheets. Um, but if you see that red on there, that means that's copper and that means it's not silver. And that means it's from 1965 and later. So that's why we call those clad. It's that sandwich of a uh, copper and nickel together. And uh, you can see this big, huge sheet right here. They take these sheets and they coil them or roll them. Uh, they're really long. It's probably about 10 football fields long of a coil. Very, very heavy. That's why you have to have forklifts at them and to move them. So if you look at the uh, diagram on your screen there, 
these big forklifts move those big coils of metal into place on a big spool that unwinds it into the blanking press. The blanking press is like a gigantic cookie cutter that just comes down and punches out holes in the sheet. The leftover webbing that comes out, it's these things, they uh, look like bow ties. And then you have these blanks that go out onto another conveyor belt. From there, they go into something called an annealing furnace, which means it uh, heats them up and then it cools them down in a quench tank. The reason you do this is because you want to make sure that the metal is stable. If they didn't do that and they just punch the blank out and then you strike a point on it, the metal is still uh, what they call brittle or it could still break and it wouldn't really be good to use as money. It lacks that durable portion uh, that we said for making something good to use as money. So heating it up and then cooling it down quickly, quenching it. Uh, actually, with annealing, the, they would uh, do that uh, slowly. They probably uh, cool it down for about 20 minutes or so. That way, when it does go to the striking press, it gets a really good strike. So after it gets cooled down slowly in the quench tank, they have to dry it off in this thing called a whirl away which brings it up to another washer and then a dryer. And then it goes on to something called an upsetting mill. And in the upsetting mill, the blank magically becomes what we call a planchet. Now, those of you who ordered those uh, kits from us, you got a planchet in that kit. You have a struck scent over here on uh, this side. And over here, this is uh, what we call a planchet. It's just a blank. Um, that has gone through the upsetting mill. Um, it's kind of hard to notice, but the planchet has a raised rim. It's about a thousandth of an inch smaller than a blank. Not that we'd be able to tell with our eyes, but it does have a slight rim on it, and this helps it. Uh, it's, uh, the fancy term is a proto rim. And then when it goes into the striking chamber, it really helps it uh, keep a good strike together. So you guys already do have a planchet. Remember, this is not a blank. It's a planchet because it's gone through the upsetting mill and it has a raised rim around the or on the edge, okay? So planchets are what coins are struck on. So you can see right down here that planchet goes through the stamping or the striking press. After the coins get struck, you can see right here we've got a little dude looking at all the coins that are coming out. If they look good, they go on to this conveyor belt to want to be counted, weighed, and then stored in a vault. But the bad ones, they wind up going through into a really cool machine called a waffler. The waffler, of course, uh, really destroys coins and kind of makes them look like uh, waffle fries. It's really kind of uh, cool. Um, but that way they think, well, people can't use it as money. And then it goes on to be scrapped and then recycled to be turned into to new sheets to be uh, to start the process all over again. So this is, a, again, a very involved process. Please don't feel bad if you're thinking this is very confusing. I don't understand what Sam is talking about. It's OK not to worry. Um, uh, come out again. Come out to Colorado Springs one day and we'll uh, teach you all about this. Or you could look on our archives right now, uh, on our A&A Learning Academy. Uh, e-learning academy and you can see a, a presentation i did over the summer that goes over all of this but again here's all those steps again really really quick uh just to go over them again the blanking press that's where they make these uh huge huge sheets that go in and get stamped uh, uh they get punched out uh, they punch out these blanks uh those blanks wind up getting cleaned they get heated then they go through the upsetting mill where they get squeezed ever so slightly to put a little rim on them. Then they go to the striking press where you have two coin dies that come together. Um, the modern, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, but the mint nowadays, they use about 50 tons of pressure uh, to strike the coins uh, design. And they actually have uh, not just one die at a time, they'll actually have a series of uh, four different dies that are together and all four come together really quick to make uh, four coins at a time, but they go so fast. It's almost at a blinding speed. Um, they can make about, I don't know, about 12 coins in one second um, or about 750 in a minute. It's pretty cool. Or at least 700 coins in a minute. Anyway, 
So after the coins are struck, uh, like we said before, they wind up getting inspected to make sure that mistakes don't get out. This is why guys like me and some of my friends like to collect what we call error coins. Uh, you have to be careful with that because a lot of times you might see a coin that's damaged and think it's an error, but that's not always the case. Um, so we'll talk more about that another time. But then, like we said before, those good coins after inspection wind up getting counted and then bagged and weighed, and then they wind up going into a vault until they're needed by banks. And we'll talk about Federal Reserve Banks in a little while. But again, here is that diagram of the modern minting process. Just one more time. Just wanted to make sure you guys could see that before we uh, you know, take a look at some of the people and uh, the machinery that's used at the mint. Now, I know uh, <clears throat> some of you guys might be looking at that and you're thinking, Sam, what are you talking about modern minting process? I mean, you look at some of these old dudes right there at the mint and some of the old equipment they're using. looks very dangerous. Right here, you've got a lady as coins are coming out of a machine right there. Being struck, big, huge uh, die press. Some of the modern machines that you see right here and some of the other uh, modern mints that we have today. And then down here, my guess is this is probably San Francisco because if you look carefully, you might notice that they've got machines that are kind of packaging up different coins, different denominations, and it looks like they are making proof or mint sets. Probably, uh, well, those could be mint sets. They don't really look too shiny like uh, mint coin or like proof coins. And then, of course, when you look right here, this is the not so modern minting process. Boys and girls, making coins throughout history uh, is considered a very dangerous job. Um, I mean, right here you can see they were literally using horse power to uh, generate uh, power to strike uh, coins at the mint. This is an old screw press uh, right here. There's a 15-ton screw press right there. You have these two teams of guys who are working really hard every 15 seconds, swinging these big steel arms uh, back and forth to – make that, that screw press right there go up and down to strike coins where this little eight-year-old kid sitting there in a pit would have to very carefully, you would maybe have about two or three seconds to put a new blank in there. The press would come and strike it. He'd have to take that new coin out and put a new blank in all day long, many hours a day. How many fingers do you think that kid was missing? Sad job. But anyway, yeah, good thing. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, just be glad we've got child labor laws right now, guys. So you can see, yeah, some really old ways of making coins. I mean, back in ancient times, you can see they actually had to take coin dies and uh, hold them in their hand like this and actually use a hammer to hit them. Uh, very, very dangerous work. But uh, we don't have too much time to get into error coins, but a lot of times people think, well, how do you value error coins? Well, the value a lot of times comes from what we call the wow factor. Like when you look at a coin, does it really make you just say, oh, my goodness, look at that thing. That is crazy. I want it. Um, all of these coins I wouldn't turn down in my collection. Um, I mean, you've got something right here we call a blowout where there's actually a hole in the sheet that uh, was run through the blanking press. That happens. Um, yeah, here's an even bigger hole right here. That thing looks like you can almost use it as a paper clip, that penny from 1970. Over here, this is a pretty common error. It's uh, what they call a clip or uh, a, a clipped planchet. Um, unfortunately, when that blanking press is striking uh, or um, it's punching out blanks, sometimes it goes over a hole that was already punched out. And so you only get a partial blank produced. And then it wind up striking a coin on it. This down here is a really cool one. That's a, believe it or not, a really old denomination, a 20 cent piece. We only made those for a little while in the 1870s. Um, and yes, some of those were made in Carson City. Uh, San Francisco is a bit more common, but seems weird to say common when you talk about a 20 cent piece because they're all really hard to find no matter what mint they're from. But this is a, what they call a laminated planchet where the metal just didn't, uh, wasn't poured correctly and uh, as a result um, after the coin was struck it kind of peeled like a clam uh, opening up so that's what they call a clamshell lamination very hard uh, error to find and then right here in the middle uh, this was a Lincoln cent 
well, it was at least, I uh, don't have a full date, but we know it was at least from 1959 uh, because that was when they started making uh, the Lincoln Memorial cent reverse uh, 50 years after uh, the Lincoln cent was first made starting in 1909. Yeah, really cool how it's just uh, made on a struck uh, fragment like that. Really strange. We could sit here and just look at error coins all day. Uh, one of my favorite things, that thing you see in the middle there is what they call a bonded cluster where uh, blanks just kept getting fed in and they weren't getting ejected. So it just kept piling up and make this big, huge uh, cluster of cents. That's probably about 19 cents face value right there. Probably about 19 different uh, planchets that were fed into the machine to make that. But oh my goodness. Yeah, you find things like that. They are worth a lot of money. You have to ask yourself, how did they get out of the mint? But story for another time. Um, right here. Uh, gigantic error we call a cud this big blob looks like a cow's cud uh, they've been chewing on that just landed on the coin uh, that's from when uh, part of a die just breaks off you have most of the design on there but the other part of the design just looks kind of like a blob because metal was missing um, really fun error over here from the Lincoln Memorial sense they used to call these prisoner pennies because the bars uh, from the columns on the uh, Lincoln Memorial kind of make Abe Lincoln look like he's in prison. Um, this is a half dollar that got struck off centered. Uh, unfortunately, when the plant should got fed into the, the press, they usually get struck, you know, solid, like, you know, pretty straight on, but apparently this one, it got <coughs> struck, you know, just off center. So that's why half the design is missing on that one. And then down here, these are errors. You guys could probably find one of these today if you have a pile of change at home. It's not a very valuable error. They're kind of common, but it shows a big crack in the die. And if it was on the die as a crack, it's going to be a raised line on the coin. So look on sometimes on your coins, like look toward where the rim is and going on to the inside, it might look like uh, lightning bolts. See a big one there and you see an even smaller one right here. If you guys look at that. This tiny little crack that's starting. And the more a die like that is used, each coin it strikes, that crack is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it just shatters. Um, that's why they have mint inspectors there right there on the line when coins are struck. Because if they catch, you know, things from or mistakes that are happening on the line, they can stop the press and try to make sure those error coins don't get out. Now you know why error coins are worth a lot of money. So look very carefully at your coins, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, because there's some really strange things going on. Okay, guys, before I let you take a break, uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and then I'll uh, let you take a couple minutes. So again, what do we call the round metal discs without rims that are punched out of those long metal sheets that go into the blanking press? They are not planchets. The blanks. Planchets are the blanks that have gone through the upsetting mill and have that tiny little uh, rim on them. Uh, here's a picture to kind of help you guys understand. Uh, on the left right here, there's a, a blow up uh, picture of a, a blank. If you notice, it is just completely flat all the way across from edge to edge, completely flat. Now this is a planchet and you can tell you can see the shadow right there. You can see there's a tiny raised rim where it goes up all along the edge. You see how it's a little bit lighter in color there? That's because of the way the metal is bending up toward the edge there. Just to let you know, there's just the tiniest little rim on that. So that's ready to get a strike. Uh, that's ready to get a blow from the dies and the strike press. So hopefully you guys understand the difference between a blank and a planchet. So moving right along, don't forget, what do we call those lines on the edges of a dime and a quarter? I mean, we could see letters, there could be stars, could be numbers, but those lines are called reeds. And how do those reeds get there? They're struck by what we call a collar. Um, when the obverse and reverse dies come together to strike a coin, at the exact same time, you have what's called a retaining collar that comes in. And those lines are on the inside of those retaining collars. And that's how those lines get put onto the edge. Um, if you didn't have a retaining collar come around the, the edge of a coin at the same time as the dies come together, 
you get what's called a broad strike where the metal kind of squishes out like a pancake a little bit. So that's why you really want to keep uh, that retaining collar to help strike the third side of the coin. It's almost like a die in a lot of ways. So getting out, oh, apologize. Um, we'll talk about this one in just a little bit. But uh, Logan, before we move on, um, were there any other questions from the audience? Yes, so we have a few. Uh, why There's always a couple of questions with minting. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> Why did the mint put a date or mint mark over another date or mint mark with the die? Oh, that's a really tricky one. Now, sometimes, well, well, first of all, you have to understand that the U.S. Mint is a branch of the Treasury Department of the United States. They're always trying to do what they can to save taxpayers money. We're the ones who fund that, right? That's where the money comes from. So, in order to try and save money over the years, they will try and do certain things to save materials, to conserve uh, certain coin dies. Um, they usually make a certain amount of coin dies for every year, but if they haven't used them, well, you can't really just throw it out. Why would you do that? Maybe they could just kind of change the last digit on a die. So they may do that. Um, sometimes dies had to be transported from one branch mint to another. See, way back in the day, Philadelphia used to make all the dyes for all the mints and ship them to those mints. So let's say the Denver mint had plenty of D mints, uh, or uh, you know, plenty of uh, um, dyes with a D mint mark on them, but San Francisco is having a shortage and they don't have enough. So rather than Philadelphia saying, okay, well, it's gonna take us a while to send you guys one, why don't you just contact you know, the people in Denver and they'll send you uh, one of theirs. And when you get it in San Francisco, you can kind of try and scrape off that D and repunch it with an S and you could use that. So that's why we get sometimes what they call over punched uh, mint marks. And sometimes at a mint itself, you have to understand after the dies are made, up until about 1990, you used to have people at the mint who would sit there and actually literally punch mint marks into each working die. Not each coin, because that's insane, because they make billions of coins every year now. <laughs> that would be way too much work. But they would punch them into each working die by hand. And sometimes by doing that, you don't always get the right strike. You know, a, a guy might be sitting there and pound that in. You might look at the die and say, oh, I did it backwards. Or, oh, no, it looks a little crooked. So rather than try and go through the whole effort of re-engraving that die, you might just say, well, I still have the punch. And if I punch it harder, maybe it'll get rid of, you know, that older punch that was there. Now, of course, you know, coin people like me, and we'll talk more about tools of the trade. And, you know, if you look at certain coins with a really good high power magnifying glass, you'll notice those uh you know, inconsistencies with mint marks and uh, what they call repunched mint marks or RPMs or uh, repunched dates. But um, that is a huge topic that we just could not get into uh, much at all today beyond what we've already uh, mentioned. So hopefully that answered the question a little bit. Okay. And the next one, is there a device to tell real and counterfeit money apart? Uh, yes. The human eye. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I mean, there are lots of tools you can use. Uh, one of my favorite to check for uh, counterfeits is a, a digital scale. Um, one of the hardest things for a counterfeiter to get right is uh, the weight because you're usually using precious metals in a certain quantity. Um, so it's always hard for counterfeiters to get the exact dimensions of a coin right, where it'll be the, it's still uh, the same size uh, that a coin should be, but also of that same purity. So that's one way. Uh, you can look at coins sometimes and notice uh, by using a magnifying glass if the design is sharp and crisp. Um, this is why we teach, uh, you know, detection of counterfeit and altered coins uh, at uh, some of our uh, uh, events that we have uh, at shows and, of course, our summer seminar. Um, yeah, come out and uh, take that. Or if you can't do that, we have our correspondence uh, diploma course uh, that you might want to look into at some point. So, uh, yeah, you could take the uh, counterfeit detection course. Uh, through the mail but uh yeah if you could take it as a live course uh personally i think that's a little bit better perfect and then do you do you know what year range the ancient coins from the kit are are they all roman 
Oh, yes. Uh, the ones that came in the uh, kit that you guys got are all pretty much, uh, yeah, the, uh, these right here. Um, most of the ones, uh, <laughs> the ones you guys have probably aren't as detailed as uh, this one. Um, but almost all of the uh, ancients uh, that I included in the kits were from the mid fourth century AD or uh, right around, uh, I'd say around the years 330 to 350 or so. Um, a lot of them have uh, sons of Constantine the Great, uh, the Christian emperor. Uh, he was a guy who made Christianity a very popular religion in the Roman Empire. And uh, without him, it probably wouldn't even be a popular religion to this day, some might argue. Um, really important, uh, some of the stuff that happened. If uh, you look back in history, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, he has a dream and the, you know, sees uh, the sign of the Flaming Cross. It's a big, big long story. But uh, these are... Um, the, the coins that you guys have are uh, sons of that emperor, Constantine the Great, uh, the, who was nicknamed the Christian Emperor. So uh, for the uh, kiddos out there that really enjoy uh, their, uh, their religion, hopefully you guys get a kick out of that. I mean, it's a, a direct artifact, a direct link to the Christian Emperor, uh, Constantine the Great. Um, again, uh, you have to understand the ancient Romans made so many coins, so they're not tremendously valuable. Again, uh, most coin dealers might sell those uh, little ancient Roman coins for a couple of bucks uh, just because there's so many of them, but really cool stuff nevertheless. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we, we can't answer any um, value questions because we are not a grading company. We're an educational organization. So uh, we appreciate you asking, but we, we can't answer those. Um, the next one is destroying money legal. Um, well, it, it depends on how they mean. If they're talking about a, uh, for example, I mean, I don't want to do it right now. I've done it many times before uh, in classes I've taught where I've shown kids, hey, want to make half dollars at home and not get in trouble? Just rip in half. Uh, uh, honestly, it is not uh, illegal. I've done that before. Um, you can do what you want to with your money. Here's the catch. It would be illegal to deface money in a way that would try to make it a different amount. For example, if I'm taking all of my nickels where it says five cents and I'm scratching the word 20 right in front of that to try and pass it off as a 25 cent piece, that's illegal. I mean, you could sit out, out there on the sidewalk with a hammer and your pennies and just sit there and keep banging them all day long if it makes you happy. Uh, probably shouldn't do that. Um, ruin a good hammer um, or a good sidewalk and your money. Why would you do that to your money? Um, again, as long the key is, as long as there's no intent to defraud, you can do what you want to with your money. Um, I don't think you should. Um, it is, uh, I believe, uh, it may still be on the books. I know back in 2006, uh, there was a law that was passed that you can't really melt down uh, U.S. coins because we were having a coin shortage. Um, or, or not so much a shortage, but uh, the... Um, prices of uh, copper and nickel were going up way high to the point where even now, uh, nowadays, uh, it costs more to make the penny and the nickel than their face value. Uh, it was really weird to hear a mint uh, di uh, director tell me in 2006 that by making money, we're losing money. Really strange. Losing money because we're making money. So that's why there's a lot of talk of, hey, we need to get rid of the penny. I'm not going to get into that argument here, but you guys can think about it if you want. <laughs> and the next question, do mints have different lines for each denomination or do they change the presses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, they might, for the, the pennies or the cents, because they make billions of those every year. Those machines are probably dedicated to just making cents. And those are going like all day, every day, all the time. The other denominations, they do make millions of those, hundreds of millions, uh, sometimes into the billions, like for the state quarters. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they might not just change out the dies. Uh, all you really have to do uh, a lot of times is just change the actual die and you can put it in the same press. Uh, so that's a pretty good question. But chances are for the, the pennies or the Lincoln cents, those are probably just dedicated because they make so many pennies all the time that it wouldn't be worth it to change those dies out um, for different denominations. The only way they're changing dies out on those machines is when the dies get too worn uh, from striking coins. Good question. Perfect. And then isn't the 1985 cent a brockage error? Which, 
Um, it says 1985 cent. Uh, it could. Uh, was there one I showed? That, uh, I'm not. I mean, 1985 cents. That I mean, a brockage error could happen at any time, uh, in any year. Uh, it, it has more to do with the collar die coming around uh, the the planchet in the the chamber, uh, and that could happen in any years. Um, I know uh, in my collection, uh, I have uh, some, I think, that are from the 1990s, uh, somewhere in there. I have a couple of Brockage uh, coins in my collection. But, yeah, it's not just unique to any one year, though. Uh, what is the rarest coin error? That's kind of hard to say. Uh, there are lots of really different ones. Um, I mean, it, it, technically, I could say all of them because coin errors are classified as unique. Um even off-center coins that look the same, they're not going to be exactly the same. So technically, every coin error is a one-off, or they're all unique. Whether or not they're going to bring huge money on the secondary market is another story altogether. And whether or not it's going to give you that wow factor where you're going to look at it and say, oh, my God, I want that coin. So there are differences like that, too. But, yeah, the value or rarity – uh, value for error coins usually comes with that wow factor. When people look at it and say, "Woo, that's really cool. How the heck did that happen? Those are the ones that usually go from uh, stupid money. <laughs> and then I think they're clarifying the 1985 question. They say it is one of the errors, error coins you showed. You refer to it as a prison or jail scent. Oh, that might have been, uh, you know what? Let me check. Uh, let me check right up here real quick. Uh, that one, no, that one was not a brockage. That was a regular shot. That's what they call a die clash. I apologize if I did not mention that. Die clashes happen when um, dies come together and there's no plancha that goes in between them. I am very sorry. I just got so hung up on the excitement of seeing a prisoner penny because uh, they're kind of cool. Um, die clashes, um, the dies come smacking together under so much pressure. So if there's not a, a planchet in between them, you're going to wind up getting image transfer from one die to the other. So that's why those columns from the Lincoln Memorial showed up on the obverse. And on the reverse, you probably have part of the outline of Abe Lincoln uh, showing up on parts of the reverse as well. So no, that's not a, a what they call a brockage where it got squished out, but that is what they call a die clash. And thank you for uh, checking me on that. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, do you have a double-struck penny in your collection? Do I have a what now? A double-struck penny in your collection. I don't. I might have one. I'd have to look where there was one regular strike and then another strike that was off-center. I don't think I have one in my collection. We might have one. I might have one in a collection of coins I use when I teach, uh, but it's probably at my office at the a and so uh, yeah, it's probably in my in the ANA building about eight miles east of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last one's a little morbid. What would happen if you put your hand in a press? Um, well, the good news is you could just use that in vending machines all the time. Just be sure to just use the tip of your finger so you can put that in as a no. <laughs> um, you would um that that's an emergency room visit for sure. That's an expensive hospital stay. <laughs> Uh, that's not going to be an uh, outpatient. Um, uh, if you're familiar with the word excruciating, that probably comes close to what you'd experience if your hand got caught in a point. Stay away from. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm. It uh, yeah, it, it, yeah it, it's not fun, I'm sure. I've, it's never happened to me because I'm usually very careful. We have a, mini, a miniature version of a screw press mint in our basement at the Money Museum. And uh, yeah, I'm always very careful not to get my fingers in there. So uh, but you never know. One day, remember, accidents happen because you didn't plan them. So I'm always careful for that reason. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Well, that's all for this portion. That was it. All right. Well, hopefully uh, you guys were able to uh, take a bit of a break there. Because um, I mentioned this question a little earlier to you guys. I wanted to see if you remembered, because now we're going to start talking about paper money. Hopefully you remembered where we said uh, when and where the first paper money was made. Hope you guys already remembered it was in China around the uh, 7th century going into the 10th century a little bit or the 600s into the 900s. 
And if you remember the ruling family at that time, give me a couple seconds, see if you remember. The Tang Dynasty. And of course, you remember uh, there was a really fun name they had for the paper money at that time because if the wind got hold of it, they would just call it flying money. So, boys and girls, moving on now to the parts of a banknote, parts of a bill. Uh, you guys might call them bills, but the technical term is banknote. So you may hear me using them interchangeably today. So the parts of a banknote. Now, first of all, our paper money is not real paper. I mean, think about it. How many of you have ever left a dollar in your wallet or a dollar in your pocket, goes into the laundry, mom or dad does the laundry, and you notice you've got shredded paper everywhere? Well, you don't if it's paper money. A regular piece of paper, like a napkin or a tissue, is going to fall apart. But our paper money is not really paper at all. It's really crisp. Um, it actually is a mix of cotton and linen. Uh, we don't put wood pulp in our money. Um, that, it, it, that wouldn't work out too well. Um, it, it would fall apart. So we tend to use about a blend of about 75% cotton and about 25% linen. Linen is a fiber um, that's... Uh, it comes from something called the flax plant, um, but not wood pulp. If we used wood pulp, your money would fall apart. Um, our paper money is pretty durable. You can actually fold uh, the stress tests that they use uh, at the um, BEP or Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Uh, on average, it's about 4,000 back and forth folds that you can get with uh, paper money before it'll fall apart. Here's a huge pile of uh, linen. Uh, waiting to be boiled, bleached, and added to cotton uh, at the main manufacturer of our paper money, Crane and Company. Crane and Company is in Massachusetts, and they uh, still to this day are the uh, manufacturers of the uh, secret recipe for our uh, paper money. Uh, I know I said it's a uh, you know 25% linen and 75% cotton, but there are certain other things that are added that we will probably never know. So those are rough estimates. Okay. So I know you guys had a uh, picture of a diagram of the parts of a coin, uh, the parts of a bill. Uh, there are other ones there as well. Now, with a, a bill, you have all sorts of different numbers. You've got uh, – you have to understand uh, a bill uh, is – or banknotes are made on huge sheets of paper. And from those, they cut them out. To know where on the sheet of paper your bill was made, you can look up – at right up here, what we call a position number. It tells you a letter and a number where that was on the sheet. And I'll try uh, show you another diagram that might show that a little bit later. Um, a lot of different things going on. Uh, one of the most important things you guys will notice is uh, what we call these district numbers. Sorry, let me show you right here. There's a letter uh, that refers to that number. And we'll talk about that in a little bit with uh, Federal Reserve Banks. Um, these are all parts of the... Uh, um, requirements that you guys need to know, uh, especially if you're a scout trying to get your merit badge. Now, give me just one moment, please. All right, so uh, rather than get really involved in a lot of the parts of the bill, you guys have this diagram. You can see a lot of them there. Serial numbers are very important. Uh, notice that they're in, uh, they're offset uh, because there's a way too tricky to get into now where you could probably cut a bill into nine pieces and then on a diagonal line to shift it so it's each uh, bill is slightly smaller. You cut into nine pieces to make 10 bills, but each one is going to be 10% smaller. Not going to get into that too much right now, but that's why they do that, why they're put diagonally that way. Um, you have the uh, seal of the Treasury of the United States. Um, and of course, we'll get into Federal Reserve numbers in a little while. Plate numbers are very important as well. Uh, they make many printing plates that uh, that are produced and put all together to make uh, a uh, a banknote. Uh, you can see at any time we also have the series and date. Uh, you've got uh, the Secretary of the Treasury as well as the Treasurer of the United States. Um, of course, it usually tells you at the top what type of note. Uh, the notes that we have in circulation now are Federal Reserve notes. Uh, throughout history, we've used uh, gold certificates. We've used silver certificates, uh, and they've used different colors. The gold ones would use yellow. Silver certificates, they used blue. 
instead of uh, the green. So if you see a $1 bill out there and you see all this blue instead of green, look up top here and chances are it says silver certificate. And the year on there is probably going to say 1957 or earlier. So you notice how many times they say on here. They don't want us to be confused about what kind of note this is. I mean, if you just look, I mean, look at how many times they say one. One dollar, one dollar. I mean, they spell it out right here. And then on the back, one, one, really big. So they do that, you know, to make sure that you know the denomination. Uh, very important. You don't want any confusion when it comes to money. So moving right along, and again, I know uh, you scouts need to know this. So uh, those of you that are trying to earn your CCMB, when we meet next Saturday, um, these are things you're going to want to remember. Who are the people on our money? Now, these are some of the ones that most everyone should know. These are the current notes that we have circulating in America now. We don't make notes that are higher than 100 uh, anymore. We used to. Uh, of course, $1 bill, George Washington. Uh, you can see all the other different names there as well. But believe it or not, boys and girls, we made different denominations. We had a $500 bill, $1,000, 5,000 or 10,000, and yes, at one point, even a hundred thousand dollar gold certificate. So, show some photos of these. Now, the regular denominations, I'm sure most of you guys know uh, these right here. Anyone out there know how much a two dollar bill is worth? 200 cents. They're not rare. You can go to the bank, you can get them today. Um, maybe not today because it's Saturday, they might be closed. But on Monday, go to the bank, you give them two regular dollars, they probably have a $2 bill they can give you. They're not really rare. Uh, if you see the ones with red seals uh, and instead of uh, the green, that means it's a United States note. They used to make those uh, many, many decades ago. Um, and those might be worth a couple of dollars. If they're from the 1928 series, some of those might be worth a little bit more. But if they're from like the 1950s, or 60s, not worth as much, but still pretty cool when you, when you see those. But no, guys, $2 bills are not rare. They're worth 200 cents, 20 dimes, 40 nickels, eight quarters, four half dollars. Moving on. So regular denomination notes again. We've got the 20 with Andrew Jackson. We've got the 50 with uh, General slash President uh, Ulysses S. Grant during the U.S. Civil War. And then right over here, Ben Franklin on the $100 uh, banknote. So you guys have seen these. Now, what you might not have seen are the old school, old large denomination notes. And sometimes I wonder why we don't bring these back. Um, I don't know if we need a 10,000 nowadays. I know I will probably never own one. Uh, um, but these are worth a lot more than just the face value nowadays. Uh, Every now and then I'll get calls from people who work at banks uh, and I go to banks a lot. I try to be friends with those people because uh, they bring, uh, they're the ones who are in charge of our money. Um, and, and I like to uh, look through a lot of uh, coins from the bank. So always be nice to bankers for that reason. And just because it's the right thing to do, but they'll call sometimes when they get these large denomination notes, uh, especially the 500 and the thousands. Those are a little bit more common. Five thousands is, you don't really see those very often. And the 10,000, uh, I think the only one I've ever seen is the one that we have on display in our money museum in Colorado Springs. So those were the largest denominations that were able for people to use as money. But you remember I mentioned another one a little while ago, the $100,000 gold certificate. Now, these were made a long, long time ago, back in the 1930s, only for big banks to transfer money from one to another. It was not something that a private uh, citizen could own. They only made 42,000 of these. Uh, all 42,000 of them uh, have been recalled by the, um, the Federal Reserve. They know where every one of them is. Some of them are on display in uh, um, some of the branches of Federal Reserve banks. I know there's one in Denver I've seen on display and it's always cool to see a real one in, uh, in uh, person. I've seen, uh, we have a proof of one uh, um, at the Money Museum in Colorado Springs that you could check out. It's exactly like the, uh, the real one. It just doesn't have a serial number. So it was not one of the genuine ones. It looks just like this where it has just zero serial numbers going across there. There are many fakes of these because no one can own a real one. 
And people always get really upset when I tell them, no, you don't have a genuine one. But the, and I tell them, be glad you don't have a genuine one. Because if you did, you'd be going to jail. Very illegal for a private citizen to own. So moving on now. Now, some of the uh, parts of a banknote. Um, remember before I said that we don't want people to counterfeit our money. So if you ever have a chance to look at a banknote up close, you might notice what we call microprinting. Uh, really tiny letters. I mean, if you guys look right here, here's a blow up of the of a fifty dollar bill of a President Grant's uh, shirt collar. Notice, really tiny. How it says the United States of America. How cool is that? Uh, the reason why you do that is if someone tried to make a copy of it, let's say on a copy machine, it would turn blurry. So that's one method of trying to make sure that people aren't uh, making fake notes. Um, I don't know if you guys ever noticed on a $10 bill right here where Alexander Hamilton is, um, right there at the torch of the Statue of Liberty, it just says USA 10 over and over and over again. It's really, really cool how it does that. I mean, you might not notice when you look at a bill far away, but it, they made all those uh, lines that are on there are made of tiny, tiny little cuts. It takes an engraver at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing many months to engrave just one printing plate. And if they make a tiny mistake that they can't uh, rub out with um, uh, certain uh, sanding stones that are used for engravers, months work can be destroyed with just one mistake. So they are very careful about making our printing plates. So here's a little bit of a blow up that you guys can see right here. I love the, the detail on the $50 bill right there. That's so cool. So, if you guys, um, well, if you ordered one of those kits from us, you got uh, a sample of a $100, uh, old $100 bill device. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that right here in front of me. I thought I might have. I'll have to check. I might actually, oh, actually, I yeah, apologize. Got it right here. Um, if you got this in uh, that, that uh, kit that you ordered from us, this is not a real $100 bill. Um but it's a sample from the American banknote company of something we call intaglio printing. Um, that big fancy I word that's on the screen there. Uh, the G is silent. It's pronounced intaglio. Um, this is pretty much the printing method that they use to make our money. The paper is kind of pushed up into the printing plates. Uh, the printing plates you can see right here uh, on the screen there, there's a um, you know, part of a uh, $1 bill uh, printing plate there on the left side, and you see a $100 uh, printing plates uh, over here on the right. You see the printing plates are backwards, kind of like a coin die, and then you see $100 bills being printed coming right off it right there. But a lot of times, uh, we had someone ask earlier about how do you tell if a coin is counterfeit. One of the best ways to see if a banknote is counterfeit is remember these three little words, scratch the jacket. If you guys uh, might notice, um, if you run your fingernail over this, it's really kind of bumpy. Uh, it, it has like what we call an embossed feel. If you have a, a dollar on you, you might notice it a little bit on Washington's jacket, but not so much. Um, one note that I usually notice it on a lot, of course, because we use a lot of them in America, $20 bills. If you have a, a five or a higher scratch, like just run your fingernail over the, uh, the the president's jacket, and you'll notice you'll feel those ridges. If you don't feel those ridges and it feels flat and lifeless, instantly you know it's fake. That's one of the best tests to see if a banknote is fake. So keep that one in mind. All right, guys. So. Our banknotes are made in one of two places. Remember how when we were talking about coins, we said we have mint facilities, and there's a few of them. But with banknotes, they're only really made in about two places in America. Up top here, you have the BEP, or Bureau of Engraving and Printing, in Washington, D.C. And then there is another one that is in Fort Worth, Texas. Those are the only two places where they make our paper money. So in case you were wondering... But how do they get all that paper money to all of us? I mean, if they're only making it in two places, and I mean, if they're only making coins in a couple of places, how are they getting all these things to us? Well, glad you asked. The Federal Reserve System is how we do this. Now, all of 
uh, the banks in America kind of feed into this. The Federal Reserve System is the, a system made up primarily of these 12 big banks. And if you look on the map there, you can see the cities where these 12 locations throughout America are. And of course, traditionally, we had more people living on the East Coast of America. So that's why you see more of those black dots on the uh, Eastern half of the nation. But each one of those is numbered. Each one of those numbers corresponds to a letter, the letters of the alphabet. So for example, A is the first letter. So the first uh, Federal Reserve Bank, Boston, is A. Number one, then the second letter of the alphabet, B. Second letter, that's New York. The third is Philadelphia. The fourth one is Cleveland, uh, or C, three, and then D, four. Then Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri, and then, of course, Minneapolis, Kansas City, Dallas, San Francisco. So, depending on where you live, the closest one, you'll usually see more of those notes than any other number. <coughs> Pardon me. Out here in Colorado Springs, where I live, we see most of our notes that are from Federal Reserve District 10. So we'll see a lot of the ones with a 10 on them. We'll talk about that here. Here's the way to, to code those. Like we were saying before, it goes with different letters of the alphabet. So, for example... Let's see, I've got a couple different notes here. So I said it before, I live here near District 10. So naturally, J, 10th letter of the alphabet. That's why you see the letter J there. And the Federal Reserve Branch. Now, here in uh, Colorado Springs, we don't have a branch of the Federal Reserve. And we're really kind of far away from Kansas City. So there is a sub-branch in Denver. There is a smaller branch of the branch of the Federal Reserve in Denver. So the way that these things work is the banks across America will usually tell these other bigger banks when they need money. These big Federal Reserve banks are the ones that distribute the money that is printed by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, as well as the coins that the United States Mint produces. This is how the money is sent out to those places. The bigger banks send them to the smaller banks, and then those small banks send them to even smaller banks where we usually go to get our money directly. So that's long and short kind of how the Federal Reserve works. It's a pretty tricky process, but it's really interesting because they gauge, I mean, they, they have an idea of how many coins and paper money they should make every year or every month even, but it's always being adjusted based on the orders they're getting from smaller banks. And we're at a time now where there's a lot of confusion with that because people aren't going out and spending as much money due to the pandemic. So it's really strange uh, sometimes how the Federal Reserve has to adjust on a daily basis to the needs of money for America. Kind of cool when you think about it, really tricky process. So we uh, just went over a lot of information and we're gonna have a lot more uh, coming up here in uh, just a moment, um, you guys just bear with me for a second. I will let you guys take a, uh, a little bit of a break here as soon as I get some uh, answers to my questions. So first of all, who remembers the two main fabrics used in making paper money? Hopefully that's all of us. Cotton and linen, and you can see the percentages that they use or the uh, that they use in uh, the quantities to make uh, those items. Some of the known anti-counterfeiting measures that are on our money. Remember, we talked about the fine line engraving that's on there and microprinting. Watermarks are another one that are kind of cool. Now, on our $1 bills, we don't really have watermarks. Um, in a little bit here, I'm going to show you guys something. I'll use a pen to do this. Um, I'm going to have to turn out the light here in just a moment. Um, of course, we mentioned... Um, that they use the intaglio printing method, and of course, you're going to scratch the jacket. Um, something else, you guys, give me just a second here. We're going to need to go lights out for this one. Oh. So, what you guys might not realize is that you now we said there are three sides to a coin. There's really three layers to your paper money, too. Now, if I take this $10 banknote and shine it from behind, you can see that middle layer. You can see right here, 
there's a security thread going through. And right over here, we've got a picture or a watermark of Alexander Hamilton. You want to be careful and make sure that those uh, uh, watermarks match uh, who's on there. Now, something else um, that we do that you might not realize with our, our money, if you use a black light or an ultraviolet light, this is not the best quality one, but hopefully you'll be able to see those uh, security threads are actually, uh, they will glow different colors. Let's see if I can find where to say that one was again. Yeah, right here. On a $10 bill, it's kind of tough to see. I'm going to show you on a 20 Because on a Maybe 20 Maybe they'll lift it up a little bit. I don't think they can. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks. On a 20 I don't know if you guys can, if you're catching that, but you see how it glows green under ultraviolet light? And printed on there really tiny. It also does say on there USA 20 over and over again. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing tries to do a lot of things to protect our money. Some things that people may not even realize that, you know, some people know, oh, yeah, there's security threads. You might not know that they glow certain colors. Now, one of my favorite features about our paper money, you might not realize, is that the ink is slightly magnetic. Now, it doesn't mean you can just grab a, a magnet uh, from the refrigerator, but if you have a, a rare earth magnet or uh, something made of like a neodymium, you might notice that our, the ink is slightly magnetic. Now, I'm going to try and show you guys. It may be a little bit tricky to see, but it, it won't lift the entire bill completely. Well, you might notice it's kind of a – so it's kind of attracted. Logan, I don't know if that's a, coming out on screen there. If you guys can all see that. Uh, yeah, a little bit. It shows it sticking a little bit. Yeah, you see how it's like kind of sticking to it? It's a really tough magnet. Um, yeah. yeah, we use magnetic ink, and of course uh, – some of y'all might know on the uh, the newer hundred dollar bills we have that big huge uh, blue security thread there, uh, and of course there's a watermark uh, here. I'll show you right there. There's a uh, there's Big Ben's face right there. Hopefully you guys can see that. But um, something else that they're starting to do now is they use color shifting ink. Right down here, if you hold it at one angle, it looks black. If you hold it at a different angle, it looks brown. Uh, I'm not sure if that's coming up on screen. It may be really tough to see in a, on a Zoom camera, but uh, th there's just so many different things that they do. So there's color shifting, ink, magnetic ink, security threads, microprinting, watermarks, fine line engravings. And again, ultimately, I told you there's three letters you need to remember if, you're, uh, if you need to do a quick test to see if someone's giving you a fake uh, bill or not. Um, just scratch the jacket of the guy on the front, okay? So don't forget, there are two places in America where they make our paper money. Washington, D.C. and Fort Worth, Texas. Now, we mentioned mint marks when we were talking about coins. How would you know where a banknote is made? I mean, we know about, you know, the Federal Reserve branches, but that doesn't mean where they made it. That just means it was assigned to that branch. But how do you know where they made your paper money? plate number at the bottom right. If you look right down here at the bottom right of a bank note, right down in front of the plate number, if you do not see that little FW, and I hope that's coming out okay, Logan, uh, I'm not sure if you all can see that or not, but if you do not see that little FW, then that means it was made in Washington, D.C. If you do see that little FW before the plate number, or, um, yeah, the plate number, that means it was made in Fort Worth, Texas. So, easy way to uh, understand where your bank note was made. So, real quick, before I let you go, guys, uh, if you've read The Hunger Games, despite how good those books are, did Suzanne Collins get the idea for dividing the different districts of Panam in her dystopian fictional novels from our own Federal Reserve? Yeah, that'd be my guess. So... They say a lot of times that fiction, you know, art imitates life. And that is one example of it right there. So, boys and girls, um, I think uh, unless you have any uh, questions for me, um, we could uh, probably uh, answer. Uh, yeah, we uh, probably answer some questions now, Logan. If that's, uh, okay. um, what coins does the screw press at the AMA make? Ah, uh, we don't make any coins because if we were making coins down there, we'd be going to prison. It's illegal to make coins. 
Uh, what we make instead are uh, what we call tokens. Um, we make tokens down there that are, uh, let me see, I think I might actually have one right here, mini mint token. Uh, we use pewter. Uh, it's a really soft metal. Uh, it's mostly tin. Uh, we make metals uh, that are used, uh, just uh, souvenirs when people come uh, to the Money Museum. Uh, anytime you guys come out to the Money Museum in Colorado Springs, we can uh, usually make those uh, right there. We'll do a live demo and show you how coins are made. Not using real machinery that they have at the mint nowadays, but old-time screw press technology. But, um, yeah, we do not make coins on there because that would be counterfeiting, and I do not want to go to prison for anyone. So, we, uh, yeah, we make tokens or metalettes down there using a pewter. Yes. And then uh, what are the official names for the front and back of a banknote? Ooh, really tricky. Front and back. Perfect. Yeah, if you look at the uh, at the program uh, guide, if you guys printed that out uh, where it says the parts of a banknote diagram, um, grab that again real quicker. Yeah, it will say uh, yeah front and back on there. Uh, it's probably on the sides. It's a little trickier to see, but um, yeah, if you look right here, it's on the side. Yeah, front and back. <laughs> what question? Um, yeah, a lot of people because I'll you know have some coin people think they're being real smart and they'll say the obverse of this banknote, sir, and say uh. It's not called obverse. It's the front. Stop doing that. It's just called the front, man. <laughs> Is the negative image on the device a device for making dollar bills? I think it was the... Oh, um, when we were showing printing plates? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, was... yeah. For um, yeah, for printing plates, that's like a coin die. That's what's actually... Uh, those get smeared with ink. Um, then the ink gets wiped off. And then the ink that's left in the recessed parts winds up uh, getting stamped onto the paper. And, and again, remember, banknotes are printed, but coins are minted. Yes. And then um, how many mints does the EU or the European Union have? It's an excellent question, and I honestly don't know. I could try and make up something and say, like, 11, but I do not know. It's a good question. That was a great question. I think that's yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. What about it, huh? Yeah. Okay, well, guys, uh, we're uh, kind of running uh, not low on time, but uh, I just want to let you know you're doing a heck of a job. I appreciate your time today. Um, we're going to try and get into the next part of this presentation um, where um, it is the last part of our presentation. There is a lot to cover, but um, and we'll go over it somewhat quick. That's why I gave you those program guides to hopefully uh, help out with that. Um, and you'll be able to email me anytime if you ever have any other questions. So I don't want you guys to uh, worry too much. But right now I want to go over just some ways to collect and beginning things to make you a coin collector. Because now you know how coins are made and how paper money is made. But now if you're going to start collecting this stuff, let's talk about real ways to do this. So there is a right way and a wrong way to collect coins. Um, you want to make sure that you're handling coins properly. Um, you always want to hold coins by the edge, by that third side. We have oils in our skin and sweat. And if you hold a coin like this, see, I'll do it with this because this is a circulated coin. This is one I've been carrying in my pocket for years and years. It's a silver dollar from 1896. Ain't that pretty? But um, yeah, these coins right here, um, I, I mean, this one I don't mind, but to show you for real, um, this is how you should always hold collectible coins especially if it's a proof coin. Uh, you might not notice that we have oils in our skin. And if you hold a coin in properly, you might not notice it right away, but those oils, that fingerprint is still left on the coin. And if it stays on there for too long, it's gonna be on there permanently. You'll never get it off of there, no matter what you do. And you don't wanna clean coins. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes here, but it's very important, hold them by the edge. And even before you uh, hold coins, if you're gonna be a collector, before you deal with your collection at any time, be sure to wash your hands uh, beforehand and wash them afterward as well. Um, money is dirty. You do not want to touch money and then eat something. Bad idea, even before coronavirus. Um, and it's always a good idea not to talk over coins uh, because little microscopic bits of saliva will float out into the air, which we're all learning about nowadays and they will land on the surface of coins. Um, the reason why that's a bad thing is you'll get these little black spots, what they call fly specks, 
And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute here. Um, we get people asking us all the time, how do you clean coins? Don't. Do not clean them. It's not a good practice. Clean is a dirty word in this hobby. All right. So let's point that out. Uh, there are right ways to conserve coins professionally. That's a story for another time. I almost didn't want to mention it because I don't want you to think there is a right way to clean coins. Most times to try and attempt to save a coin, usually wind up killing the coin ultimately. Don't do it. You want to keep coins away from heat and humidity as well, because I could uh, have, if there are other chemicals present in the environment, it could have bad effects to your coins. There are many ways to store coins, and we'll talk about that in just a little while. But here are some pictures of improperly handled coins. Sometimes you might uh, have coins in a certain holder that have staples, um, these little cardboard flips that you can put coins in. If you have a coin that's stapled in there and then at some point you decide, I want to put it in a different holder, if there's still staples in there and you try pulling that coin out, if you're not careful, you'll get a huge staple scratch on the coin. As you can see what happened right here to this poor wheat scent. And you can also see there's lines on there from a, an old fingerprint. Man, this poor, that was a gorgeous wheat scent. Man, that thing got destroyed twice. This one you can see right here, uh, there's a Liberty Head nickel from 1900, and you see that green stuff right there. That's because, uh, and well, I'll talk about this a little bit later too, but there are some holders that they use for coins um, that are actually made of a soft plastic called PVC. Um, and the difference between that and like the, the sturdy plastic or the safer plastic ones, uh, the PVC ones kind of smell uh, like a brand new shower curtain because uh, they're made of vinyl. Um, so they're safe to use every now and then, but if you keep a coin in there too long, the chlorine will kind of leach out and it could potentially uh, make this green slime on your coins that, that happened to that poor nickel there. Remember I said you can get those fly specks, the little black spots for talking over coins that aren't protected. So that's what happened to this. Uh, oh, and that was a good buffalo nickel too. Man, that's a shame. But um, so it's okay to talk about coins, just don't talk over your coins so mind your preposition there so sometimes coins the way they're stored um certain chemicals will react uh with the metal uh, uh the certain chemicals in the environment and this takes a, a long time to develop uh genuinely uh because some of these coins are so beautiful um it's kind of hard to figure out what they should be worth um Believe it or not, that uh, big one that you see right down there, uh, that uh, Franklin half dollar from 1958, that coin uh, went for some crazy money. went for over $100,000 at auction a couple of years ago. Why? Because some collector out there loved the colors on it. It's a really cool, colorful half dollar. But anyway, so different ways to store coins, as you can see on the screen right there. Like I said before, you have these uh, cardboard, what we call two by two uh, holders um, because they're two inches by two inches. So you've got some where you can put them in, you know, there's a little window there um, that you can just kind of put the coin in and staple it shut. It's okay. It's a good cheap way of keeping coins. Um, I like to use the uh, safe plastic flips because uh, they can be folded down um, on the other side. Uh, you can put a little slip of paper that tells you, um, you that you can write down all sorts of stuff about the coin. So that really helps out. Um, there are many different ways you can do it. You can keep coins in tubes. Um, you can keep them in a little paper envelope. Some people like to do that with ancient coins, and they also use these uh, little um, little uh, like, uh, fabric envelopes that go inside there to really help protect the coin. Series collectors of uh, uh, early American copper coins will do things like that. Um, you can see I actually have uh, my uh, American Silver Eagle here in one of those plastic uh, containers. Uh, that helps keep coins uh, pretty safe as well. Um, you've got canvas bags. This is a really old one from a sub branch of the Federal Reserve Bank uh, down in Miami area, uh, where Logan and I are both from. Go South Florida. Go Dolphins. Um, of course, you have albums. There are other hard cardboard uh, or uh, hard plastic containers. Um, ultimately, and you have a bunch of these uh, flips or cardboard uh, 
containers together. You can just put them all in a row there in a box. You can see, I probably have a, a box right here of some that I'm working on for my own collection. See that right there? So stuff I'll have to get to after our meeting today. So many different options for storing coins. People have asked before, is there any way you can store a coin that makes it perfectly safe so that nothing will ever get to it? Well, I mean, they make uh, what they call professionally graded coins. And sometimes these are in uh, holders that are pretty good. They keep coins pretty safe. But the only method that's 100% safe is Lucite. But the only problem with putting a coin in Lucite is that it is now permanently entombed in plastic. So maybe not the best method, but many different ways. There are pluses and minuses to each storage method. And like it says on the screen here, coin collecting is a hobby. So it's... It should be done the way you think it should be done. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, with storage, make sure you're using the proper ways to store a coin and handle them properly. Um, they even make these uh, little tongs that you see right here to kind of help uh, if you're worried about holding coins by the edges. I'll show you this coin a little closer a little bit later. This is one I found last night, uh, and I'll talk, talk to you about that a little later. But there are many ways to keep coins at, in a collection or to collect coins. You can collect them by uh, all the different ways that you see on the screen right there. And we're going to talk about some of these right now. So first of all, uh, one way that I think is a fun uh, way to do is by uh, denomination. This that you see on the screen right there is a collection of all U.S. $1 coins. Not all of them were designed to circulate, but they could all be used as money. Uh, remember, any coin in America made ever since 1792 when the mint started in Philadelphia is still legal tender. You can still use it as money. Um, should you use a $20 gold piece at McDonald's? Don't think so. Um, the, the gold content is closer to about $2,000 right now, but if you go to a store, they can only give you $20 worth of stuff for it. Base value, collector value, and then bullion value, all different things. So, Here's another way of uh, collecting gold, uh, coins. You want to get real fancy. Start collecting uh, two and a half or uh, gold dollar gold pieces or, uh, or what we call two and a half dollar quarter eagles. Uh, eagle is an old denomination in American coins. That means $10. So a quarter eagle would be $2.50. Uh, half eagle is $5. Uh, double eagle is $20. So another denomination out there. Yeah, if you want to collect these, uh, start saving now, especially for the uh, No Stars variety of the 1796 uh, Quarter Eagle. That's what they like to call a prohibitively rare coin because they cost so much money to try and get one. And then you see some old proof gold here from the 1800s. Very expensive. Uh, one thing real quick I want to point out. You guys see the design right here in the lower right? That, uh, that is a $2.50 Indian design. Um, really interesting thing about the the Indian design uh, on the two and a half and five dollar uh, coins uh, in the early 1900s. It's the only design we really made that is in cuse or punched or sunken into the metal. Uh, there's no real relief. It's uh, the highest point is the field where there's nothing and the entire design is sunk in. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this also is because we're going through a pandemic right now. And you know a lot of people are nervous about handling money, so they are preferring to use cashless transaction, right? Back in 1918, during the, the flu epidemic that was going on then, people were so nervous about using these uh, Indian design coins because of the sunken uh, design features. They thought, well, dirt and germs could be in there. So if I use those, then I'm going to be touching germs. So those coins didn't circulate that much at that time. For that reason, I mean, now you look at us and we know we're not trying to use any dimes and, uh, or any uh, coins or uh, paper money, right? So you could have a set of a particular coin series, one of the most beautiful series of U.S. coins, Liberty Walking Half Dollars. You could decide to collect the entire set, all the dates and mints uh, for the entire series from 1916 to 1947. This is what we call a year set. You got a year set right here from 1921. Different mints. Some of these may have been made in Denver, Philadelphia. You can tell that Lincoln set here was made in uh, 
San Francisco because of the S right there underneath the date. This is the same set, just expanded for all of the different mints that they made. Um, not every mint that year made every coin, except uh, with the exception of the half dollar and the silver dollars. Uh, for the record, 1921 is probably the hardest date uh, to find in the uh, Liberty Walking series. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, 21 Denver, tough coin, very tough coin, especially in that condition. You could expand that to include the gold, the $20 Eagle. They didn't make a gold coin date in 1921, just that one. And they also made commemorative half dollars uh, for the state of Alabama, um, two different versions of it. So this right here is a picture of every single coin the United States mint made, or every, uh, not every literal coin they made, just a example of the set. Pretty cool when you think about it. Many different ways to collect. For example, especially scouts, pay attention because you guys definitely need to know the 50 state quarters program started in 1999 and lasted to about 2008 or well, 2009 uh, when they did the territories. Um, it was to popularize all of the 50 states with a circulating variety of uh, the different quarters. Uh, it doesn't mean that they were made in those states because you guys know about mint marks now. You just know that on the front, you look for P or D and you'll know where it was made. Or you might find S as well. So when that program ended in 2009, they started a new one called the America the Beautiful Quarters. Um, and this will end actually in 2021. We're in the uh, almost the last year. Next year, there's only one design left to go. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is something I wanted you to point out to you guys. Um, they make billion, uh, uh, hundreds of millions of quarters from uh, Philadelphia and Denver every year. For circulation. But like I said before, in uh, April of 2009, or 2019, rather, uh, the mint director announced that the West Point Mint in New York was going to make circulating quarters with a W mint mark, um, with but only 2 million of each of the five designs. So they're only making 2 million of each of these when they make hundreds of millions of the ones from Philadelphia and Denver. So naturally, the ones with a W mint mark are a little harder to find. Um, if you are into treasure hunting at all, you might want to go to the bank and see if you can ask them for rolls of quarters. Uh, maybe not the best idea to do nowadays, but you never know what you might get. Um, if you ask for some new rolls of quarters, you might be able to find some of these. Now, they started doing this in last year. Uh, so these are the five designs of the quarters you can uh, find in your change. So if you see any of these on the reverse, flip it over and look at the mint mark. Because if there's a W, you better keep that thing. Uh, they're going for a little bit of uh, money on eBay and uh, the secondary market. Uh, I don't know exactly how much, but probably at least uh, 8 or $9 a piece. So I would pull them if you see them. Uh, we were happy when the mint announced that they were going to continue this for 2020 not knowing that we wouldn't be able to get to banks in 2020 to get them. So it's been really difficult trying to find them this year. Um, but these are the five designs. They just came out with the last one uh, right here with the, uh, the butterfly on it for tall grass prairie. So all five designs have been released this year. Um, and this year, 2020 also marks the 75th anniversary of the end of world war II. So, uh, the Mint actually just last week or uh, the week before came out with uh, some really rare uh, silver eagles, uh, proof silver eagles that have a tiny little mark right there that say B75. Also some very tough to find gold uh, eagles that they did with that as well. Uh, they only made 1945 of those. Um, very expensive coin. But they also made those 2 million quarters of each of the designs. And I love the little fruit bat design on the American Samoa one. Um, some people were trying to spread conspiracy theories, you know, with bats and COVID and saying that those quarters were spreading the disease. Uh, well, it kind of reminds me of the uh, pandemic of 1918 with the uh, two and a half and five dollar gold Indian pieces uh, with rumors like that that were going around. But um, I wanted to show you something because I went to the bank yesterday and I got uh, some rolls of quarters. I was able to and one of my friends who works there uh, held uh, some of the new rolls of quarters for me. So uh, on the ones this year, you'll notice they actually have that little V75 punched in above Liberty. Uh, so that's just on the ones for 2020. 
And uh, I wanted to show you guys that um, I was going through some new rolls of those, uh, the fourth design uh, from Vermont, the Marsh Billings Rockefeller one. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough, uh, I, I went through a few rolls and I did find a, a couple of W's. Uh, here's one right here. So this is what they really look like, guys. Uh, Logan, I'm not sure how well that's coming up on screen. Um, uh, I, if you dimmed your screen maybe a little bit or oh, yeah, because put your the, uh, hand, yeah, it might be more clear. How's that? Then hope that's a little better. Okay, good. Maybe tilt it a little bit so that the light gets all of it and... Is that yeah? Go back and forth. Yeah. Perfect. It's kind of an important thing for coin people. We uh, usually tilt and rotate coins under light. Very important for grading. We'll talk about that real soon. So yeah, they're out there, guys. So I, I I found one. So there's more. Um, the the reason why they have the shape around that B75 is because of the reflecting pool of the World War II memorial in Washington D.C. So if you're wondering why they came up with that outline or the cartouche, uh, that's why it's like that. So um, look for those quarters now if you're into treasure hunting. Uh, you can find them if you're able to get to the bank. This is the last design for the America the Beautiful uh, series coming out next year. There's a line drawing of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site in Alabama. So that's the last quarter to come out for uh, next year. So like we said before, many different ways to collect coins. They don't always have to be round. There are many different shapes that coins can come in, too. As you can see right here, I love that little butterfly one at the bottom. That is so cool. But anyway, guys, it is time now to discuss conditions of coins and coin grading. Um, it's one of the hardest things to do. It takes a long time to get really good at this. But it really, uh, it's kind of like evaluating things. And you might do this in your own personal life where you look at certain things and you say, yeah, on a scale of one to 10, what do you think about that? So we do that with many things in our life. Coins are no different. And the first guy who came up with this, a guy named William Sheldon, he was doing this to try and come up with values for a large uh, old copper cents uh, that we had in the 17 and 1800s. And he came up with a scale from one to 70. So 70, of course, is the idea that it's a perfect coin that just came off the dies, no marks on it. This one is pretty close to a 70, might be a 68, 69. There might be a couple of marks if I look at it in the right light. But coins that are uncirculated show no traces of wear. It is nice and shiny and even all the way across on all the devices, on the picture, nice and clear, no trace of wear at all. Now, as a coin gets circulated, you have to understand our fingers will, you know, go across the surfaces. So the highest points of coins will start to show the first signs of wear. You might notice on just the highest points, you see tiny little bits well, on the highest points where you, you see uh, parts of the, the shine is not exactly the same. So if you're going to be someone who wants to grade coins a lot, you have to have really good light, uh, good magnifying glasses to be able to, to tell if there's wear or if there isn't. Then as time goes on, the coin will get worn a little bit more down to about a 40 or 45 to the grade we call extremely fine. Um, sometimes they abbreviate this with an EF. Uh, I know a lot of collectors uh, and myself personally like to use XF. Um, X is a cooler letter, but um, it's just easier when writing conditions down. This uh, turns out like that. But um, there's still a lot of the design left on an extremely fine coin. There's probably still little parts that still have a little bit of mint luster remaining and hiding in parts of the letters of a coin. And then you get down to about a very fine, this is probably a good, very, a nice, very fine right here. About two thirds of the overall design are still visible. Everything else is still there. It's still sharp. You can read everything. Not really a problem. You can see where everything is. But then they wind up getting down to more and more worn to fine, which is about a 12 to 15. Um, with very fine, that's a little trickier to figure out because there's like a, a 15 point spread. You can have a 20 or up to 35. So it's a 15 point spread. Really tricky sometimes to grade very fine coins. Um, then it, as conditions can get worse and worse as a coin gets spent, uh, very good. <laughs> Strange to call it very good, and it's kind of very bad. It's uh, 
most of the design is missing, but you can still see a lot of it with very good coins. If Liberty is in the headband, you still have to be able to read at least three of the letters for it to be considered a very fine coin for the most part. Then when you get down to good, a lot of people call me and say, I've got a coin, it's in good condition. I always tell them I'm very sorry because good is not the best condition for coins. It's a four or six out of 70. And you can see a good, see if you look at, you can see the differences right here between very good and good. More of the design has been worn away as it gets spent as money. Um, some of the, like where that rim was, now it's kind of merging into the field and it's kind of hard to see if there's even a rim at all. But then of course, you wonder, well, is there anything worse than that? Yeah, you could get down to what we call a pour. When you see this right here, this is about a, maybe a, you have almost good three or a poor one. Poor is pretty much the lowest uh, grade where you can actually kind of make out some of the detail and kind of tell what it is, but most of it is completely gone. So that's kind of the differences between coin grades. Now, when you talk about proof coins and uh, mint state or uncirculated, uh, understand that proof is not a condition. Proof is a method of manufacture. Proof is a way that different collector coins are made. They use specially polished uh, dyes and specially prepared uh, planchets that go in. Like this is a planchet for a regular mint state coin. This is going to make a coin that'll, that would be circulated. But proof planchets are specially uh, polished and burnished and uh, really treated well before they're struck. And then, of course, as you can tell, the coins are completely different. Over on the left, it doesn't have that mirrored finish the way that a proof coin does. And then, of course, just to confuse matters, you have what are now called reverse proof coins that the mint has made, where the field is frosted or it has like a cameo appearance, but then all the devices and letters are actually mirrored. So different uh, way of collecting coins. So we talk a lot of times about helpful hints for collectors. Um, one of the most important things to me to put in that uh, kit that you guys got was a red book. Um, my job at the ANA is numismatic educator. Education is everything when it comes to doing well in this hobby. If you are a person who does not like to read, this is probably not the hobby for you. If you're a bookworm, dig in. Coins are for you. We always say in this hobby, buy the book before you buy the coin. Um, it is easy to spend money badly. Um, a lot of times people ask me, hey, Sam, how do I make a little bit of money in coins? I say, you want to make a little bit of money? Start off with a lot of money. Don't do it for profit. Do it because you like it, because you like coins and you want to learn. There's so much about them. There's so much history. There's so much artistry, uh, math, science. It all comes together with coins. Um, and you want to be patient when you're buying coins. You want to buy the right coins for your collection. Um, don't be afraid to make friends. Talk to other people out there. Um, be careful who you talk to out on, uh, online. There are some weirdos. I'm sure your parents have uh, warned you about that already. But ask people about coins. This is why you need to email me here at the ANA if you're not sure of something. There are coin clubs all across America. Go on the ANA website, money.org, and at the top where it says find a club, click on it and find people in your area. They might not be meeting in person, but they're still uh, meeting by Zoom the way we are right now. Um, there is a lot of bad information on the internet, but there is some good stuff out there as well. If you check out the ANA's YouTube channel, um, my boss, Rod Gillis, has put together these amazing short little videos we call video vignettes. Uh, tons of watches, tons of people have seen them, and for good reason, they're awesome. Short little videos that go over certain things to be a good beginning collector. Please check out Rod's uh, video vignettes on our ANA YouTube channel. So good, you'll be glad you did. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bad info out on the internet, but... Uh, uh, books and magazines are a lot better. Um, of course, a um, little question for you here real quick. Let's say you had $1,000 to go to a coin show and you had to use to buy coin. What would be the right course of action here? If you were going to go out onto the floor, if you had $1,000, look at the choices you have on the screen right there. Which one is the best course of action, do you think? 
Should you go out and buy a thousand coins for a buck a piece? Maybe you should buy a hundred coins for just ten dollars each. That'll be slightly better, right? Or ten coins for a hundred dollars each. Think about it for a second. <coughs> Guys, the correct answer, I hope, I mean, there is no real right or wrong, because remember, it's a hobby. You can do it however you want to. But if you want to be good at coin collecting as time goes on, you have to understand quality is everything. It's real easy to, like I said before, spend you know money badly in this hobby. But to take the time to develop that eye, to really look and see what a good coin is, it's worth it overall. Let's, I mean, if you're interested in making money, this is probably a better way to do it over time because the coins you get now, I mean, it's real easy to buy coins that are damaged, but as time goes on, it's hard to sell those coins. So keep that in mind. A um, couple other things I want to talk about um, at the ANA. Um, of course, um, one of the best things about uh, ANA membership um, and we'll get there in a little bit. Um, magazines, like I said before, I mentioned uh, real quick with the uh, books. Magazines are also important. This is our house publication, the Numismatist. Um, this is something that we have uh, every month. Uh, pardon me. Every month comes out. Uh, I actually have an article that I uh, put out every month now um, called Treasures in Your Pocket. And I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But there are many other uh, specialty magazines, too. Um, Fun Topics is a... Uh, Magazine put out by uh, Florida United Numismatists, one of the best uh, other coin organizations in America. Um, another really good one, they uh, put out uh, uh, magazines about uh, different coin errors, uh, error scope. Uh, There's a the publication of a group called Coneca, the combined organization of uh, numismatic error collectors of America. I am a member, really good organization. Um, another really good uh, magazine out there, Coin World. Lots of good stuff in there. Uh, Coin World, the, uh, I believe the, uh, the monthly ones, they'll actually have price uh, information. Um, we also have something as well that we've uh, passed out at the uh, American Numismatic Association uh, when people come in before. The uh, uh, market review, this shows all kinds of uh, different prices uh, for the different conditions that we were mentioning before. So those are available. Um, now, of course, another one, this you might be able to find online through a, a grading company called PCGS out in uh, California. Uh, the um, Rare uh, Coin Market Report uh, is a very uh, popular magazine, the uh, RCMR. Um, so just wanted to mention some of the uh, other magazines before we move on, but some of the programs we have at the ANA. Hopefully you guys have noticed uh, up here on the wall, I've had this... Uh, or coins for A's flyer, um, shameless plug for that. If you have good, good grades, uh, all you need is at least three superior marks in a marking period. Uh, so A's is a generic term because that's what most people will use. If you have at least three A's in a marking period, send us a copy of that report card if you've not done yet, if you haven't done so before, and uh, we will mail you a coin from somewhere around the world. So uh, you can do this four times a year, right? Four quarters, uh, all the way until you're done with uh, high school. So uh, take advantage of it if you haven't already. Those of you that are in first grade, be thrilled because you've got years of coins coming. Those of you that are in 12th grade, uh, it's kind of a messed up year anyway, right? Anyway, so some of the other things we have at the American Numismatic Association. We allow our uh, YNs or young numismatists to do certain activities. And on our website, we have uh, posted ways to earn YN dollars. And we actually have these... Uh, we make our own internal money at the ANA. YN dollars. You can get these for doing certain activities. In fact, I think uh, for doing uh, this workshop today, you can uh, request 25 YN dollars just for doing that. So you can see the denominations pretty much match our U.S. denominations that we have here. And every month, I put up a few items for auction. We get a lot of people who donate coins to us and they say, give them to the kids. And we're like, I'm not just going to give you things. You need to earn them. It's the way life works. So if you've done certain things to earn YN dollars, I will mail you some, which can be used for buying things in our YN auctions. 
Like I said before, I put three things up every month, but then in September every year, we put out a catalog with about a hundred different items, all kinds of things. And the items really depend on what we've gotten donated over the, the, the past year. We put these together in a catalog and we save up those YN dollars. You could own some really cool things, things that some of us don't even own. And it makes us jealous. Yeah, but it's cool that you guys are getting all these awesome coins and we can't. But anyway, other activities. Now, this one is for you kiddos who are pretty much between the ages of about 5 and 11. Once you turn 12, yeah, we really won't let you do the dollar project. But all these flyers are on, uh, online, too, through the ANA website. So more information there that you can find. The dollar project is doing certain activities. You get some really cool coins, which will prepare you for the two older YN projects, ancient coins, and then the early American copper coin project. Um, by doing those, if you like uh, early large cents or, and even half cents, um, you could do the EAC project. If you like ancient coins, do the ancient project. Um, by doing certain activities, you can uh, submit proof of that. You mail it to me and I will mail you hopefully a really nice uh, ancient coin or uh, early uh, copper. Um, some of those coins, uh, I see the old price tags from the dealers that donated them, and some of them have three figures on them. Yeah, some of them number into the hundreds of dollars once you get into the advanced part of the project. So uh, save those. It's worth it if you can. Uh, some of the other things that we uh, do um, on our website, again, money.org, a lot of different activities that we have uh, for YNs. Uh, if you look uh, under YN resources, a lot of activities. There's a link to the U.S. Mint website, and they have some fun games and uh, other things there as well. Uh, if you ever get to one of our ANA shows again, when we start having those live, and we plan on doing it uh, again in March of uh, 2021 in Phoenix, Arizona, hopefully we'll all be able to make the uh, National Money Show next year. But this year, when we had it, it was in Atlanta, and I usually make a scavenger hunt. Uh, you can walk around to every table. Uh, asking dealers uh, some of the questions that are on here, uh, according to the tables, uh, participating on the front. And if you get that question right, they will give you certain coins. They want you to get the question right, too, so they'll help you. So you'll get the, the certain coin. Um, Numismatic Guarantee Corporation, um, one of the coolest things, uh, they will give a sample graded coin. They've done these before. They've done these before, which I love. I love Kennedy Half Dollars. Um, and you get this for free just for completing that treasure hunt at shows. So if an ANA show is coming to town, please come see us at the Kid Zone and uh, we'll give you one of these sheets. And uh, you can go around and start asking uh, trivia questions and earning some uh, cool prizes. So uh, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, uh, we do have a periodic table of the elements on our website, uh, the numismatic elements. Uh, this is a really cool one because it takes every single element out there and it actually shows examples of coins that were made out of them or uh, how those metals have been used over history. So uh, uh, we actually have a promo, a promotion going on right now where it's just $25 total with postage. Uh, so if you check out on the homepage of the ANA website, it talks about holiday things you can buy. Check that out. So you can get that poster. Uh, good Christmas idea or Hanukkah. Christmas Hanukkah Kwanzaa present. Something else you could do as well. We have a diploma program, like I mentioned before, correspondence courses where you can learn all about uh, coins. Um, we're gonna have them online one day. We're just working on that right now. It's a, you know, still a dream at the moment. Por los jóvenes, you know, se hablan español. I do have uh, something on our uh, website uh, that is a translation guide from uh, Spanish to English for uh, certain coin terms. Uh, it's actually something I made for our uh, dealers that uh, speak with uh, customers that may speak Spanish to help them understand uh, certain coin terms in Spanish. If I could do it for every language, I would, but I only speak a little bit of Spanish. Uh, something else, like I mentioned before, on our website, there's a feature called Treasures in Your Pocket where it goes over uh, certain things you can look over or look at uh, in your own change to know the difference between an error coin or, you know, just damage. Uh, and again, remember, I have a magazine article I put out every month in our uh, uh, publication, The Numismatist. Uh, 
T-I-Y-P. Um, yeah, I have a new uh, feature coming out uh, real soon. So hopefully you guys will read that and uh, try and teach you about certain things you can look at to uh, try and find uh, some really cool things in your money, like W Mint Marked Quarters. So guys, something else you might want to look for in your change. Uh, I gave you uh, some wanted posters in our uh, in that program guide. Um, look for carefully for these coins right here. Um, I mean, it's pretty easy to find a 1969 San Francisco Lincoln cent if you look through enough uh, coins. But finding one with the doubling really strong like this on the front is near impossible. Um, if you look at a 1969 cent and you see it looking that blurry, it has to match that exactly or it's not it. Um, there are a lot of them that kind of look like that, but they're not. If it looks like this, um, that might pay for college for you. So keep that in mind. Um, and from 1982, uh, Denver, you can read about this. And if you uh, printed out that uh, um, the program guide, I also did a Treasures in Your Pocket article about this a few months ago. This is actually uh, the very first coin I featured in that uh, as a, uh, uh, a Treasures in Your Pocket uh article because um, I did it as a silent dedication to my wife because she was born in 1982. So that's why I did that. Um, but yeah, there are some 1982 Denver cents uh, that are a lot more rare than others. Um, these are actually more rare than the 1969 San Francisco one I just showed you, but uh, these are not quite as valuable. Very hard to find though if you find a copper small date 1982 cent from Denver. More information in that post that you guys have, so you can always take a look there. So we're going to break uh, in just a little bit for the day. Um, there are lots of different websites uh, out there. Um, again, a lot of them may not be reliable. I tried to include in that program guide uh, some of the most important ones. Um, but there are most of this I did just to give credit to the people that I uh, borrowed images from. Remember, uh, you guys have to do that for book reports in school, right? You have to give credit to your uh, source of information. So that's all I'm doing right here. Just, you know, all the uh, different uh, photos uh, that I had. But guys, got some good news for you. As of this moment, uh, you technically have the credentials to become what I would consider a YN, a young numismatist. So give yourselves a little round of applause. Um, like it says there at the bottom, you can email me questions Anytime you have them, uh, real tough, really uh, tough uh, email address too, samatmoney.org. So email me if you have questions, guys. Um, something I would like you all to know is you uh, can use the code that's on the screen there that's highlighted, uh, YCC210. That is not a zero. It's an O. Um, use that code, and you can get your first year of membership in the ANA for free. Uh, bad news for those of you that are already ANA members. If you're already a YN in the ANA, sorry, we can't extend your uh, membership by a year. This is only for people who have not been members before. So please uh, write this down because I'm going to uh, um, move on from this screen. Um, those of you that uh, are joining us uh, as a scout, uh, please stay with us because I'm going to talk about uh, – some opportunities uh, for uh, the Coin Collecting Merit Badge uh, that we'll be doing in next week's meeting. So uh, stay with me. But everybody else, uh, if you signed on, I mean, of course, you could listen to the Scout stuff, but you don't have to. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you wrote down that membership code. Please write it down now if you haven't already, or do a screenshot because I do have to move on from this screen. Um, that code, YCC210. Not zero. Make sure it's an O, not a zero. Um, and that's what you will use to get your first year of free ANA membership. Um, before we get into the things for scouts, uh, I'm going to put up the uh, – uh, we'll answer some questions, uh, if that's okay, Logan, because I'm sure people probably have a lot from the stuff we just spoke about. And then I'll uh, give you the information uh, for scouts, okay? So did we have any uh, questions out there? We actually don't. I don't think so. We've had any since the last. That means I'm perfect and I did my job very well. Exactly. Nice. You made everything right. immaculate. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, anyway, guys. Um, so, again, hope everyone wrote down that discount code. Um, thank you for joining us. Remember those three important words down there. Enjoy your hobby. It is your hobby, too. 
tell other people about it. See if uh, you know you can't make people enjoy these little round metallic objects that we all collect so much. So, scouts, if you are interested in earning that CCMB, we'll see you next Saturday at the same time that we started this one at 11 o'clock Mountain. Um, we'll review the ones that we went over. But there are also some other requirements that you will need to do on your own. Um, yeah, the meeting info, uh, info is up there. Um, you could always email me if for some reason you didn't get it right here. I could always forward that to you. Um, I'll see if there's something we can include on the ANA website uh, where we have our scouts information. Uh, I'll have to talk to uh, my, my uh, buddy in uh, our IT department, uh, see if we can make that happen. But um, yeah, I know you don't want to write down the entire uh, Zoom address info right there. It's probably just the meeting uh, invite info and the uh, passcode. Uh, please do that right now if you haven't already, because uh, I wanted to go over uh, uh, some of the uh, CCMB requirements. Uh, and then after that, if you're a Girl Scout interested in getting our Fun With Money patch, uh, please stay on because I'll go over those requirements real quick too before we sign off, all right? Okay, guys, so I had to get rid of this screen. I'll give you another uh, five seconds or so to write down that invite and uh, passcode. <coughs> okay, so next week, these are the uh, CCMB requirements for scouts. Now, everything that's in black, we went over today. We'll review those things briefly when we meet next Saturday. In red are all the things you would have to do on your own. Uh, the one that's in purple, I'm kind of going to leave that one optional to you to do on your own before we meet or you do it on your own still, but after we meet. It's on your honor, Scouts. Please, I'm trusting you there. Um, the way this will work, too, is after we meet, uh, when we meet next week, um, of course, you know, I'll have it, uh, you know, gallery style so I can see everyone's face. And you'll need to hold up to the screen uh, the things uh, for requirements five, six, seven, and nine. Um, I may have to ask you a, a question real quick. So it's going to be like, you know, not like a, a full on uh, jamboree, but, you know, we're trying to do what we can here, guys. Um, so, Logan, I'm not sure if you're on. If there are any scouts who have questions about any of the stuff that's up right now, uh, hopefully uh, they could do that. Uh, I mean, of course, you could probably ask your local council as well. They might be able to help you. Um, for the record, uh, just in case anyone out there was wondering, I don't, I didn't print out my latest uh, youth protection one, but no, I am a uh, certified CCMB instructor, guys. See right there, it's my current uh, registration for uh, uh, being an MBC for the CCMB. Um, Logan, are there any questions that anyone has about these requirements or? Uh, None have come through yet. So okay, you please let me know if that changes. Yeah. All right. So um, then uh, on to the, uh, if you are a girl scout or brownie and you are trying to get your fun with money patch. Uh, again, all this information is under our uh, young numismatist resources on the ANA website, money.org. Um, and, and you can see, I have to, this will be two different screens. Everything in black we went over today but we would review on Saturday. Uh, everything in red, you would be responsible for doing before we meet next time. Uh, so you've got a week to get this stuff done. Uh, Scouts, uh, BSA, and Drill Scouts, I hope you've already completed some of these things on your own. Otherwise, I'm sorry that that follow-up is coming uh, in just one week. I wanted to give you two weeks, but unfortunately, uh, I think there's a holiday going on in two weeks. Not that it's going to be any Thanksgiving that we've ever seen before. <laughs> going to be a weird one this year, but um, yeah, I, I, because Thanksgiving's coming, that's why we made the follow-up this uh, coming uh, Saturday, uh, the 21st, uh, instead of the uh, 28th. So, uh, Girl Scouts, if you're uh, trying to get your FWM patch, um, you can see these same requirements on the uh, ANA website. They won't be highlighted like this, but if you use a, you know, some common sense, you can figure out, oh, well, that's something I would have to do on my own, uh, or you know, before, you know, we meet again, you'd have to do a drawing. Uh, we did a coin rubbing today, so you're good there. Um, some of the other things. Um, where in number six, I put that in purple because you can do a virtual tour of the ANA Money Museum. 
So you could do that one uh, pretty easily going online. Um, same with uh, number seven there, uh, where it says to uh, visit uh, our website and write a report. Uh, I won't force you to write a report, but if you're going uh, on a tour of the ANA website, well, you knock out number six and number seven at the same time. Um, and number nine, you would need to show me all the state quarters from any one year. Um, one nice handy way they do that, um, here's like an example of all five of the quarters that came out in 2018. So you could just pick any year, find all five of the designs for that year. You could do it for this year. You could do it for any other year. It just has to be the same year. So keep that in mind. Um, and then for number 10, um, you can visit a U.S. Mint facility virtually. So you could uh, satisfy that requirement that way. So um, just wanted to um, find that out, or just wanted to let you know that. Logan, were there any other questions uh, that came through? Yeah, so somebody, I think it was a Boy Scout, asking if they have to do all of that by next week. Unfortunately, because that's uh, when we're going to be meeting uh, next. Uh, I, again, I couldn't extend it two weeks uh, because we're getting into the holiday season. So that's why I, uh, I was just mentioning that we uh, have the follow-up coming up. But again, for number 10, you can do that on your own. I, I can be flexible with that. You can do uh, um, you know, a tour of the Mint facility. You can do a virtual tour after our meeting. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm actually uh, fine uh, with you doing that. Um, but I, if I didn't have a chance to say this, uh, after we meet and we go through those uh, CCMB requirements, you will need to mail your blue cards into me. Uh, you will need to uh, into the ANA. Uh, I'll give you my address uh, at the ANA, and we'll go over that. Um, uh, yeah, I spoke with my local council here, the Pike Peak Council, and uh, we pretty much they authorized it. They said yes, it's okay. Scouts can mail the blue cards, and as long as we've met all the requirements uh, via Zoom meeting, I can sign off and mail the blue cards back. That way, uh, you can get your CCMB. All right. Okay. And the next one, uh -huh. um, they have a prior engagement during the time uh, you're having it next week. Is there any okay. way they can fill the require fulfill the requirements? I'm so glad that came up because I knew there was going to be at least one person who said, "I'm doing something because I have a life." I'm like you, Sam. So I knew there. <laughs> Uh, there may be some people who are busy. Uh, if we and we can't really record it, uh, we won't record a scouts meeting anyway. Um, but what we would do, uh, just for privacy purposes, that's why. Um, but you could always email me another time uh, after Thanksgiving, and we could try and set up a separate Zoom meeting. Uh, not alone, of course. Uh, we don't do you know one on one. Um, no scouts. We would. Uh, Maybe uh, with a parent there, or if you have another scout, another friend who could join in on that meeting, and then you could satisfy those requirements that way, and I would be okay with that if you're okay with that. Um, so hopefully we could do that. I mean, we can always do this. I mean, let's say you're so busy up until maybe even January, and you're like, Sam, I know here I am emailing you in February. I still need to get my CCMB. I was at the YCC class you did no, on November 14th, but I couldn't do that follow-up on the 21st. That's fine. Email me. We'll set up a Zoom meeting and we can go over those requirements um, and we can uh, handle it that way. I mean, or worst case scenario, you email me pictures of everything and we go back and forth with the email discussion. I want you guys to get the merit patch. I want you to get that CCMB or the fun with money patch. So believe me when I tell you, I will work with you to make this happen. So don't worry. You guys are, and you're already about halfway there. We already knocked out about half the requirements. So I just have to look through a piggy bank and try and get some of those uh, other things out of the way until we meet next time, all right? And then whoever raised your hand, um, I can't allow you to speak, but if you can put your question into the Q&A or the chat, I can read it to Sam. Yeah, cool. Go for it. I'm sorry if you can hear the wind happening outside. Yeah, it's a... I, I think I'm okay here, but yeah, it is so windy out here today in uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, and yeah, Logan, I don't think you're too far away from me, like maybe a mile up the road too. I think you're close to me on the uh, east side of town here. So yeah, we're getting it pretty bad because uh, we're not as protected by Pikes Peak and uh, the front range of the mountains that are on that side. Behind me, that's the east, and that's where all the wind is coming. So. Yeah. I apologize if that was disturbing anyone. Uh, no, I think I can hear mine. I, I just was wondering if it was <laughs> nice. interrupting your speaking. 
there's yeah, things flying into my windows even. Uh, understood. So I'll leave that up again real quick uh, easy, uh, in case anyone needed to write it down again. You said there was a uh, someone else who uh, had a question, but there were. Yeah, they haven't entered it. But yeah, if you have questions, I need you to put it into the Q&A or the chat and I'd be happy to read it to Sam. But that's the only way I can answer questions for you. All right, that's fine. But... And again, guys, all these requirements are, uh, uh, well, all these, uh, the CCMB Scout ones, those are all uh, on the ANA website and, of course, the Scouts BSA website. Um, then the uh, Fun with Money patch uh, requirements, that's only something the ANA does. So you would have to go through the ANA website, and those are all listed there. Again, it won't be highlighted, but hopefully you remember the things that we just went over because you'll have to uh, discuss, and we'll review them real quick. So not to worry there. But um, Logan, yeah, I don't know if uh, there are any other questions, but um, – One just came in. I assume okay. collect under number nine means I actually have to have them. Any recommendations on how to do this? Piggy bank, change jar. Coffee can. Hopefully, uh, yeah. Hopefully, you have that stuff laying around at home. If not, you know, um, again, I know it's uh, only uh, one more week until we're meeting. Um, one thing I would allow, if you couldn't go out and get the coins, because again, I want to make I want to make sure you guys can get the merit badge. How about you print out pictures of coins and cut them out to size, paste them on a sheet of paper all together, and that'll work. And he says foreign coins and notes, not U.S., I'm assuming you. Foreign. Oh, you mean world coins. Yeah. yeah foreign is a word that usually means weird and unusual. And some of them might be unusual, but foreign, uh, I, I, I like to say world coins uh, usually <laughs> when I can. So what was that about world coins? Uh, that was the same question. I assume collect under nine, nine means I have to have them. How many, any recommendations on how to do this? He meant yep. worlds notes and coins yeah you'd have to do it yeah so you maybe have to get 50 foreign coins um yeah um i pronounce it world but uh scouts bsa pronounces it foreign um yeah you could get uh 50 uh world or foreign coins uh you could find uh printouts of uh, pictures of them online and print those out and i will take that that's absolutely fine that is acceptable perfect yeah, just uh, Thank you. hopefully color photos because uh, uh, if they're black and white, just make sure we can actually see them. You know, the little black circles, uh, it's not really a coin. So make sure it's legible. <laughs> All right. If there's no more questions, which it doesn't look like it, we can go ahead. You guys can find this on the website when they put it up here in a couple of days with along with many other great resources and uh, thanks to Sam for this. We all learned a lot. I know I did. And uh, we hope to see you on the, the Scouts one next week. Nice. And again, any questions you ever have for me, email anytime, sam at money.org. All right. You guys have a great, great weekend. Talk to you thanks, soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.